Inside the shoulder. I can't find a light on here, Baba Tunde. She's here to log on. Log in now. I don't know. She says she has joined. Let me let me let me search again, please. Baba Tunde, on light, huh? It's being added to the panelists. When I was setting up, I added all the key uh, leaders, team leaders of uh, of yeah, as a panelist. Okay, maybe she hasn't joined. She said, she said, she said she has joined. Okay, let me just look for her. But okay, I, she I, has. I, I, she said she can hear me. Okay, no problem. But I can't see her name. It's okay. Oh. She said she can hear me. It's fine. It's fine. She's in. That's what she say. She's saying. It's okay. Thank you. Yeah, are we about to start? It's yes. 10 after 10. We'll start at 10 15. Um, good morning, Madam Joy. Good morning, good morning. Chair. Good morning. Okay, Mr. Adeshola, maybe you can allow them to start coming in so that by 10 15 we can start. They are in already. We have two fifty-three. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can upgrade, uh, Madam Olai, to a panelist. I, I think I've seen on the general. That's what I've been saying. I have, I have done that. I have done that. The remark I got was that she declined. I am doing it again. Okay, okay, All right, she's in. She's there now. Thank you very much. I'm here now. I could hear you all this while, but I wasn't, um, I, I didn't join as a panelist that time. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You are welcome. Good morning, sis. Good morning, ma'am. All right, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. This is uh, <clears throat> 10 15 Nigerian time, and I want to welcome everyone to this uh, IAC webinar. May I call the chairman of uh, IAC to declare the webinar open and uh, we we'll listen attentively to enjoy the presentation. Madam Chairman, you are welcome. Please unmute yourself, Madam Chairman. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you for drawing my attention. Hello, everyone in the house. Yeah, this is Yak today. Yak in March, March 2023. So I know you can't respond to me, but anyway, I'm happy to be here today and I'm happy to be with each and every one of you. It's another fun time for us. Another time of insight. So I say welcome, welcome to Young Accountants Development Committee, ICAN, ICAN, our Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, 2024 March series. It's another wonderful time, and I'm happy that I have young accountants here today. God has made it possible. You have made it possible because you're here. And now, by virtue of the past that is invested on me by the 59th president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, Dr. Okosa Innocent, 
I welcome us all here. I'm not here alone. I'm here with a couple of panelists, uh, presenters. And I'm going to be co-moderating today with another young person. And her name is Nonye Okia. Nonye, please, can you just put on your video and say hello to the house? I'm not alone today. We are... <laughs> There's another person here. So Noya is there saying hello to you. And so we welcome you all. Thank you for coming. We expect more people to be here. And thank you for always partnering with us. Um, so we will continue with the program as usual. We have our routine in ICANN. We'll start with the national anthem and our ICANN anthem so that those of us who do not know these anthems will know them. We need to be patriotic, patriotic citizens of Nigeria and also very patriotic wonderful members of ICANN. So, Secretariat, I hand this over to you. Take us to our anthem and our, the two anthems that we pledge alliance to. Thank you. I think it's the national anthem. gentlemen, members of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. It's such a great pleasure to be joining the YARD webinar this morning. It's a honor I do not take for granted. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. And to our participants, it's yet another time for us to learn, grow, unlock those potentials in us as we dive into the future of accounting with the Young Accountants Development Committee webinar. Once again, you're all welcome. Quickly, before we commence, we have so much to learn today, and I'll just run through some of it, our timetable on our program. I think we'll start with on the National and ICANN Anthem, and then let's see at exactly, oh, before 10.30, we're a little bit behind time. I will sincerely apologize for that. We'll have our first paper, and then we'll take some questions, few questions. And afterwards, we'll have our second paper, and then we're going to short break. Hopefully, we hope to do that by 11.55. We're going to short break. We'll be back by hopefully 12 noon, where we'll have our third paper. And then by 1 p.m., 
We hope we'll keep to time. We'll have a panel discussion and mentoring insight for a success, successful career path. And then we'll now round up with our questions and answers. We'll give a vote of thanks and then we'll wrap it up for today. Yes, without wasting much of our time, but just in case you're joining us for the first time, probably this is the first time you're having a webinar like this, we'll appreciate if all questions, if you have a question you want to, you want to ask, please do so by typing it on the Q&A. You can see that either at the bottom of your screen or at the top of your screen, just type in your questions. But if you need to draw our attention to anything, you can do that on the chat box. I want to also appeal to participants to stop writing their names and membership number. Godwin S.A. just did that now. Yes, Doctor Jum Nenaya Oma Onyemenam. Please let's put our hands together for her. Ma, you're welcome. We would love to hear from you. While we now introduce other dignitaries on the platform before we commence the, the our first speaker. Thank you very much. Okay. Um. Thank you. Thank you, Noye. And um, young accountants, I welcome each and every one of us here again today. My name is Jum. I am the privileged chairperson, the chairman of the Young Accountants Committee. This session is brought to you by ICANN, one of the committees in ICANN, and the name of the committee is Young Accountants Committee. The Young Accountants Committee is committed to development of the Young Accountants, who is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria because we are aware that the Institute has a lot of senior people, people who could mentor you. And so we have this, and this committee is created to give you that forum where you can have an encounter with other people who have gone this road ahead of you, who are successful, and then at least give you that um, inspiration and that motivation that you are in the right place. So today I present my brief opening speech for this session. And I welcome us all, my fellow prestigious, distinguished young accountants. Welcome to today's webinar, our match series. And it is themed inclusive excellence. And we are going to be building a diverse and engaged accounting committee, community, a diverse and engaged accounting community. It is an honor to have all of us here today as we delve into the critical topics shaping the future of our profession, your profession, the profession that you have chosen to belong to. In our rapidly evolving world, the accounting landscape is undergoing profound transformations. You will agree with, that, with me on that. Today, more than ever, the accounting profession stands at the intersection of technology sustainability, and diversity. As chairman of the Young Accountants Development Committee, I am deeply committed to fostering an environment where all voices are heard, innovation strides, and inclusivity reigns supreme. I'm not the only one. I have my committee with me. So we all are committed to this, where we all have one voice. Our webinar is not merely a gathering of minds. It is a platform for transformation and growth. And for this session, we will explore three pivotal themes. First, the first theme today will be becoming tech-savvy accountants and embracing digitalization. We have a very um, one who is very diverse in that knowledge going to present this to us. You know very well that technology is reshaping every aspect of our profession from data analytics to automation. And as accountants and particularly as the young accountants who we are, who have a very long way to go, it is imper imperative that we are not only able to adopt to these changes, but also to embrace them wholeheartedly. 
Today, we'll uncover strategies to enhance our technological prowess and harness the power of digitalization to drive efficiency and innovation in our work. The second topic will be sustainability reporting, the increasing importance of incorporating environmental, social, and governance, that's the ESG factors, into financial reporting. These things are new to us, they're not things that we did in the olden days, but at least today, they are the new trends of accounting. And that is why we're bringing it to this forum for young accountants to also get, get more knowledge about it. It is an era defined by environmental crisis and social responsibility. The role of accountants extend for beyond balance sheets and income statements. We'll explore the evolving landscape of sustainability reporting and discuss how integrating ESG factors into financial reporting can create long-term value for organizations and society as a whole. And then the third one will be diversity and inclusion, promoting diversity within the accounting profession and fostering inclusive workplace practices. Diversity is not just a booze world, it is a fundamental pillar of success in the modern workplace. Everybody talks about diversity. If you want to be successful in your workplace, you want to build a stable workplace, then there has to be diversity. By embracing diversity in all its forms, we can unlock new perspectives, drive innovation, and create environments where every individual can thrive. Today, we'll examine strategies for promoting diversity within our profession and building inclusive workplaces where everyone feels valued and empowered. Throughout this webinar, I encourage you to actively engage with our esteemed speakers, our facilitators. They are, they have been carefully chosen from their from, um, from the successes that they have recorded in their field and as young people. I will encourage you to ask to note your questions and ask your questions, just like Noye has said to you, post them into the chat chat box, the question and answer place, and share your insights. If you have insights that you want to share with us, also share them there. Together, we have the opportunity to shape the future of the accounting profession and build a community that reflects the right, the rich tapestry of our society. I would also like to remind you or let you know, as the individual, as our individual cases may be, that this webinar is accredited for two credit units. Can you give the Young Accountants Development Committee, a round of applause. This webinar is not only free, you are still going to get two credit hours of your credit units here. Each time you join us, you get some two credit hours underscoring our commitment to continuous learning and professional development. I'm sure you're glad to be a Young Accountant. I am glad to be here and associate with every Young Accountant here. In closing, I extend, I, um, not closing, right now I extend my heartfelt gratitude to every one of you for being here. And um, we stay, we stand by to hear our facilitators present. So over to you, Noye. Take us to the next. Thank Your you. Music. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma. Wow. Two credit points. That's huge. Please, I think we should appreciate the committee of YAD once again. Please, where you are, just put your hands together for them. They are putting their hands together. They're not putting their hands together. I'm not saying, okay, some of them are showing some I'm love. I can see some love. Yes, yes they're clapping. That's good. That's good. That's yeah. good. It's a free webinar, and you get to have two credit points. Wow, that's amazing. But quickly, before we introduce our first speaker, I think we have some council members in the house and it's worthy for us to honor them. We have to honor those who deserve you know, to be honored. And I think the first person now, okay, we have, uh, they are also part of the committee. We have Mbang Joy Esu, she's a council member. Please appreciate her, Ma, we cite you and we appreciate you. You're very much welcome joining us this morning. We also have um, Madam Olaito Babatunde, she's also a council member FCA. Please put your hands together. Oh, and yeah, a round of applause for our slam queen. Yeah, our slam queen. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, and I can also see my Oga at the top. Yes, Mr. Oladili Oladiko FCA. Yeah. 
Okay. We're all clapping. We're clapping. We're clapping. Yeah. We're clapping as well. I appreciate every one of you joining us this morning. We don't take, you know, your living whatever you're doing, join us. We don't take it for granted. Your presence is really lighting up, you know, the atmosphere and the whole webinar as a whole. Thank you very much. Yes, it's time for us to listen and learn and grow. And like our chairman said, we have well-seasoned facilitators joining us this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to listen to these people. I'm sure at the end of today, you're not just only clap. You're going to ask for their credit, their account details, and you're going to credit them because they're going to give you so much value, you know, for just attending a free webinar. The first paper we'll be delving into this morning is becoming a tech-savvy accountant and embracing digitalization. And to do justice to that paper is Dr. Oladipo Olufemi Adibayo ACA is in the Department of Accounting and Finance, College of Business and Social Sciences, Landmark University, Omero, Kwara State. But before we listen to him, can we just get to know more about Dr. Oladipo Olufemi? Sir, please, we'll appreciate you can activate your camera so we get to see you as we read your profile. And it's my pleasure to do this. So I'm waiting for you to activate your camera. Let's get to see you. Let the participants get to see it's you. Right. Right. Okay. Wow. Our facilitator is very, very fine. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Lupemi Adebayo ACA was born in June 19th of 1977 in Lagos State and is a native of Ijebuibo, Ogun State. He was a BSc degree in accounting, MSc degree as well in accounting. He has a PhD degree accounting and specialized in taxation. He is an associate chartered accountant. His personal, his personal research focus is in the area of taxation, financial reporting ethics, cost or cost and management accounting, financial management, finance and investment, and computerized accounting system. He traveled to the United States of America, Florida, and presented a paper titled Application of Financial Ethics in annual financial reporting of banks in Nigeria at the 10th International Scientific Conference on Economic and Social Development, Miami. That's in 25th of September, 2015. He's a tax consultant and computerized accounting software trainer to both business and public organization. He's a business partner with Sage University in South Africa. Wow. He has published over 35 articles in both national and international academic journals of high impact and reviewer for many journal outlets, Sage Open, Conjet Economics and Finance, WSEAS, Transactions on Business and Economics, Asian Journal of Accounting Research. He won the award for best research paper in taxation category under Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, ICAI International Research Awards in 2021. is a beneficiary of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, ICANN PhD, ICANN's PhD Research Grants Award in 2019. is a beneficiary of Y2007 and 2008 JDA, Petroleum, JDZ, Block 7 Scholarship Scheme, Postgraduate Degree Program, MSc Degree. His personal ambition and plan is um, institutional academic development plan based on his discipline, personal research focus, is to contribute to the growth and development of educational system globally and in Nigeria, which will enhance the economic growth of the country, networking and research development. He is currently a lecturer, pardon me, hold on a second, please. He's currently a lecturer in the Department of Accounting and Finance, College of Business and Social Sciences, Landmark University, Omoero, Kwara State, Nigeria, and happily married with children. Ladies and gentlemen, if your hands are not too busy, please join us 
as we make welcome on the platform, Dr. Oladipo Olufemi Adibayo ACA. Please put your hands together for him. Thank you very I'm much. Happy I'm happy for you. Let's listen to you as you share with us your words of experience on the subject for this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma Madam Maya. I'm very grateful. And also, I want to take this as a great opportunity from the platform of ICANN. And permit me to adopt the well-established protocols and all other protocols I've been observed. I'm also here to learn. Please can I share my slide quickly. And um, also, I can assure you, I will not use more than the appropriate time allot to, allotted to me. Now, thank you very much. Can you see my slide? Can, Please, sir, we can see your slides, sir, but it's not yet on presentation mode. Probably put it on presentation mode. Okay. Can you see it now? Beautiful. Yes. Very, Thank you very, very much. God bless you. Now, without wasting much of our time, becoming a tech savvy accountant and embrace digitalization. Now, the outlines of the presentation, we have the introduction, issue facing accounting industry in the 21st century, how to become a tech savvy accountant, what technology should accountant learn, digitalization, benefits of embracing digitalization, challenges of digitalization in Nigeria and Africa as a whole, conclusions and recommendation. Now, introduction. You will all agree with me that the world is now a global village as a lot of development in information communication technology. Now, due to swiftly growing population and a changing business environment, technological development is compulsory without technological development. Productivity cannot enlarge and economic growth would be impossible. How do by this? You can see that people are now doing business online. Look at Jumia, look at Ali AliExpress. You can get your product anywhere in the world. That's why even the country are now laying emphasis on how to tax this digital economy. But before you can tax them, you must have the knowledge of this ICT. What do you, now, the question rise. What is tech savvy? This is having a good knowledge and understanding of modern technology, especially in computers, so that I can become a computer guru or expert. When you have this necessary knowledge, that is, a person is technology savvy, it means they have the right skills, intuitive knowledge to operate modern devices effectively. It typically involves understanding technical concepts, then knowing how to apply them in different contexts. It is very important. I want to say this at this juncture. I want to appreciate the organizers of the event because this is the way the world is going to now. And the accountant, if the care is not taken, if we fail to adapt to this ICT before time, it will erode the majority of the qualified members away. Now, who is a tech savvy accountant? A tech savvy accountant uses technological device in executing his business actively. Simply put, automation. Everything, how to it solve critical businesses issues. For instance, they can use accounting software like QuickBooks. Set 50, and when I said you have Set 50 Premium, Set 50 Pro, and Set 50 Quantum, we also have Tally, Set 300, Set Evolution ETC to automate accounting tasks, which helps to eliminate human errors and save time. Now, when you talk about this, when you automate accounting tasks, we have core modules and non core modules in using accounting software. When you talk about inventory, is a core model. We talk about account receivables, account payables. They are core models like that. That's very, very important. How you can also use this is very, very important because it's happy to save time. Now, what are the issues to accounting industry in the 21st century? Because we have to look at the challenges first. The identify the challenges, then we provide a solution, the last solution. Now, lack of information communication technology literacy in the accounting field. Majority of people in accounting field, they are not vast in using computer. And thank God for instance of Chartered Account of Nigeria. Without no doubt, you will, if you remember, 
when we are registering students for ICA, maybe ATS or professionals, after you've printed the something, filling the form, signed for the student, you they have to pack everything down to a good matter. But now, currently, within three the two days, hours, once you register, just you don't need to what to send it through Korea again. But what you need to do is to package it and scan it and forward it back to them, upload it before you know you'll get back from them. And I want to use the opportunity to appreciate the ATS and the, in majority, the student affairs staff. They are, they are really doing well. Currently, we are going to have exam next week. I can assure you they've really done work in that part. So we still need more people to have this technological literacy, which will enhance the growth of this our profession. Get accounting automation. There are also a challenge of accounting. People, a lot of people, unless people work in a blue chip company, they will really have to have an idea of the accounting software. It is very, very important. And one thing about it is that when you have understanding of one software, you will be able to apply to others. Then about the change the relations for chartered accountant, certified public accountant, and accounting firms. There are different regions now. You can relate online. You can relate where you can discuss to get your clients down. The accounting profession has new skill requirements, both hard skills and soft skills. You will you agree with me. The hard skill is for the training, you acquire training through your, maybe your BSc, your master's degree, or some other profession. But when not talk about soft skill, it's very important. That one is talking about interpersonal relationship, leadership skills. Communication skills, very important. You can see our chairman, uh, you see when she was introducing herself, we all pay adequate attention to her because of our, our communication skills, which is very, very important. Now, another challenge is also tax laws are ever changing. Look at what uh, finance have really changed. Finance are 2019, finance are 2020, 2021, 2022. A lot of changes, and if a account fails, so follow up on this, you may be active and on, as an cake accountant, the rising competition in the accounting field. You lot agree with me. That's why, now let's ask ourselves these questions. There are a lot of competition in the accounting field, but why is ICANN still ICANN? Why is ICANN the leading profession in this country? Because of the modalities, because of the caliber of people that are made up of what? The head, the echelon of the institute. Because every year and there, and there, they make sure that they look for everything. They make sure they are on top, they are keeping updates. And that's why we see about that institute, but however, you can you will agree with me that I can stay the leading profession in Nigeria. How to become a tech savvy accountant. Now, this area is very, very important and it's very key. Start with assessing your current knowledge. What kind of knowledge is it? Assess it. What can I do? What is my own knowledge? Which area I think I need? Assess your current knowledge so that you'll be able to build on it. Then take free class online. Please, this, uh, I've given you this uh, site, id.sage.com. You can log on, you register, you pick up cases. You pick up a lot of online classes that will help you to have a knowledge about this accounting software. This is a Sage University and it's very, very important. At the end of this um, presentation, I will show you the certificate. So that, I'm sorry, according to you, so that you will to say, I'm not here to say the, part, the theoretical aspect, but I'm also here with the full practical knowledge. Now, read technical guides and books. There are books on the accounting system. Likewise, as a presenter, you can go to research gates. You will see that I have a textbook on computerized accounting system. Subscribe to Tech Savvy Newsletters. You know, subscribe so that you develop your knowledge. Now, practice as much as you can. Please, this area is very important. There's different to listen to the theoretical aspect. As another thing is for you to have adequate knowledge, practical knowledge, because when you have this practical knowledge, it will help you to develop the, uh, the knowledge of how to use the software. Because, uh, that's why I want to even appeal to the organizers that please, after this, if possible, 
to appeal to our Madam Chairman now to make sure that at least the price can also come up so that people can also benefit from this. Then follow the tech expert. You know, it's not that anybody that knows what I can show you the road. You follow the tech expert. You learn from them. I also learn. I also learn because also I'm also here to learn too. Then the last one that get external help. Anybody that feel like I can help you get the external help from people that have passed through the, that's why you stand on the shoulder of the giant for you to be tall so that you get whatever you need. And the moment you acquire this particular knowledge, it has now become part and parcel of you. Now, what technology should accountant learn? Fine. Cloud accounting software as reputation rights, the way accountants manage financial data, popular platform like QuickBooks Online, Sage University, and FreshBooks, allow for real-time collaborations, automated data backups, and access from anywhere with an internet connection, which means you, all these accounting software are very important. You can learn one and you'll be able to develop adequately from others. Now, however, many accountants still need help with adopting new technologies. Because some people say, hey, this is what we are doing, we can, we can continue to do it. No, this life is not like that. That things are changing as a result of our ICT. The reality is that becoming a tech savvy accountant has numerous advantages. And with the rate at which these technologies are growing, I can't have risk falling behind if they don't adapt to this. I'm telling you, because you will, not be, you will no longer be called digital accountant, you call what? You're not called analog accountants. Now, looking at this, the difference between a professional accountant and technical accountant. When you talk about a technical accounting, it's focused on staying up to date on any changes to account or professional or financial reporting guidelines and implementing those changes. While operational accounting is concentrated on analyzing the impact of daily activities and review correct operational pro processes to identify gaps. Now, as a technical accountant, you still up to date. Look at what is changing. Look at the laws, different laws. Look at now in tax system now. There's only use that's about tax promise. You be, if you are not knowledgeable in that area, you will not be able to carry out this job effectively and efficiently. Then a technical accountant computes business tax information and the business tax accounts, file taxes, create annual financial reports, or even create quarterly reports to ensure the company has a positive financial status right from using the software once you start inputting all your records at the end of the financial period you will just go to report click anyone you want to bring out automatically the system will generate it for you and before you know it your report is ready at a proper time and you agree with me that one of the features of good reporting system is what timeliness now, let's ask ourselves this Can computer replace accountants? My fellow colleagues, artificial intelligence can't replace accountants because critical aspects of the accounting portion require human expertise and judgment. I agree with you. This includes interpreting complex financial data, making strategic decisions, understanding the health context behind numbers, and building trustful client relationships 100%. But remember, Remember, it may not be able to replace accountants, but it can reduce the number of accountants needed in an organization. How do I buy this? We are we supposed to have five accountants, but with the artificial intelligence, with the computer, with the software, they can be reduced to two. Because they will feel that what five people can do now, two people can just do it with the help of the what? ICT. Now, digitalization. Digitalization is seen as a global web of interconnected activities done economically and professional dealings that are enabled by information and communication technologies. Because now everywhere, at the top of your finger, even look at phones now, everybody now, everything you want to do now is already like. Now, let me take, for example, this. If you remember, I don't know if I have been in Lagos, sorry, permit me, Madam Chairman, to just cite this example. If you remember Superstar in Lagos Island, 
we have this now passport. We have to kill you because this man making wave in the 90s. Currently now, what are you saying? You will say that we don't even need all this hard copy of soft, uh, we only need soft copy of our data. Do it to your phone. You just snap and you put it, upload it. And before you know, I don't think, I don't think whether that spaza is in existence now. Everybody that knows Lagos Island very well in the 90s. Digitalization is currently altering customer and corporate connections, necessitating new organizations and business model innovations. It is the primary driver behind the current industrial revolution. Fine. You can see now that in, it will bring about innovations to the corporate world. For example, look at the tax of taxing of this economy now. Because of our law, because of signal economic presence, they were unable to tax people that are doing business online. But now if they are they are now looking at the way they will tax people doing online business so that the people generate, bring more people to the tax net and generate adequate revenue to the government. Now, what are the benefits of embracing it? Why do you have to embrace it? What are the benefits of embracing digitalization? Digitalization has many obvious advantages, such as accessibility to information. You get the information right. Easy and immediate communication and ability to share information. New jobs and increased commercial competitions. They are as follows. No, number one, better collaborations. You all agree within that COVID-19 pandemic exposed us to this webinar. As far as we in the academy, academics, if you want to go for a conference, we have to travel to maybe international conferences. But now we can stay right in your own country and participate in the conference. Then the remote work has come to stay. Yeah, people are working from home now because they don't need to go out. If you can stay, you cannot take your own and work out from home. They can come to stay. Often this leads to improve productivity, faster decision making, and better outcomes. Because people are now last, they will be at home, they do the job, and the, what you need is just to push forward. Like the one I, was, the one that, like the one I shared with you, with Institute of Canada, Canada Processes and Procedure of Registering Students for the institutional, institutional exam. Very fast, without problem. Now, number two, enhance agility. That is to stay ahead of competition and use new opportunities. That's why during COVID 19, some people use that as an opportunity to open another business, although it has both bad and good because so a lot of people lost their life, they lost their businesses. But some people use that as an opportunity to create another business, online business, then over. And also, you look at uh, mass uh, selling, people even when, 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 what we use, this um, hand sanitizers. As a business, continue increase efficiency. It will reduce the manual work intervention and it will reduce cost and improve productivity. Number four, improve data analysis to make data driven decisions that improve business outcomes. Before you know it, with the cloud presentation and everything, it will help the business to improve its profitability and also its activities, even decision-making in an organization, especially in the corporate world. Increase innovation, increase their innovative capabilities and have a cloud-based application. At least people will come with fresh ideas, new ideas to improve the business world. Number six, improved security. This frequently reduces the risk of data breaches and cyber attack protecting the business and its customers. Uh, let me, I have the opportunity to tell you now that even the government have already approved the Data Protection Act. That's why another webinar will be coming uh, somewhere where that people will be able to know how they can protect their data, which is very important. Then improve scalability. For business that need to scale operations quickly and effectively, without the need for significant infrastructure investment, data transformation is the perfect solution. You're like, fine. Some people want to expand business plan to have the large market share. You don't need to have the infrastructure. Before you know through online, you can connect to, you can see a lot of mark, uh, online marketers, digital content online. Some people will send the advertise, they send it to their, and the customer, will, they even paste the 
testimonies of the customers that have tested from their products. This is the thing we need to work on in our society. Now, it's also cost saving. That's number eight. Our businesses reduce cost by streamlining processes, automating manual tasks, and improving productivity. Even go to bank now, a lot of, I remember when we want to do this uh, government, uh, maybe you want to do your driver's license. I don't need to go to the office to go and I just click on go to their website. I even paid online before you know, I just have to. They have to, I just have to, I printed out this statement and I paid the accurate amount without bribing anybody. And before you know, they just called me, oh, your this your driver's license is ready. And before you know, you automate manual tasks so that it will reduce all this bureaucracy process and be able to improve productivity. Now, what are the challenges? We fine, we want to embrace digitalization, but our government and our uh, leaders also to need we also have to look from this angle, Nigeria and Africa as a whole. The challenges of digitalization in Africa. Now, like I said, Adeju and Karim, I define the following challenges of digitalization in Nigeria and Africa. Number one, continuous growth of information and communication technology has changed business operations from fiscal transactions to invisible business activity. Fine. It won't, once you just do the business and no longer physical transaction, they just do the business. And God forbid, we pray that you don't fall in the hands of a wrong person so that you will not surrender your money. But I say, oh, these are the area that our government need to intervene. The low computer literate level. We still need people to embrace this. Some people are like, oh, this is we have been doing it. We will do it like that. For example, let me just... I remember in our, in our, on our campus here, we have e-learning platform. To the extent that some professors, they don't know how to use it. Look at currently now, there's a particular university, or it's online university, it's MIVA, it's currently in Abuja. Before you know, everything now is online. They, you must, they ask if you have the necessary requirement. You don't need, they say you don't need to come to physically, you want to come physically. What you need are you do everything online and you even lectures and everything, the slide, they send it to you. Currently, if you can have online, MIFA University, you can access it. It's now trending. Now, which means by a way of that, we need to encourage people to be literate in computer. Then poor internet and financial facilities. This area also, we need to die. If you remember, this one is very important. We must have a good internet connections and infrastructure facilities so that we top notch or cutting edge computers. And also possible cyber threats, cyber crime. Look at what our young guys are doing now. Yahoo, Yahoo. This, this is a challenge to us in this country. Where some parents are even hailing their children about this. If I remember when we were young, we only know that when you are young, you until you finish investing, you start making money. One, what you focus now is your education. But now, somebody in secondary school wants to be buying mansion and the societies, and with that is we need a value orientation. Then the next one, expensive mental cost. No, oh, it's expensive. I think our government can do that to society so that at least, if not 80% of people, can be computer literate because this is where the world is going to. And also a plenty power supply in our nation. I pray that God will help us. So this also is another challenge. Tracking business transaction for tax purposes, so that you track people, so you bring more people to them. We are unable to track. We are seeing some people online that are not in the tax net of the federal revenue and state internal revenue board. Leakage of revenue from the digital economy. There's a lot of leakages. Now, in conclusion, Data transformation is the process of integrating data technologies into all aspects of a business to fundamentally change the way it operates and de delivers value to customers so that you have value reorientations. While technical savviness is generally considered to be a hard skill, tech workers depend on various IT soft skills to succeed in the workplace, such as being detail oriented and curious. Being technical also requires ingenuity and the ability to please to persevere and push through challenges. However, 
hard skill can get you into the room, but you need the soft skill to keep you on the job effectively and efficiently. Now, recommendations. I have three recommendations here. The first one, industry collaboration. There is need to bridge the gap between academics and professional accountants. So that they are call town and gown. The people in the industry come to the university to give us a talk, give us knowledge, so that to collaborate what we are teaching the student. Because our product, we end up going back to the sister society to get job. So it is very important, and I think I want to salute the institute on that. They have been bringing that. In fact, if you can see academics and conferences, we have that, and professional where they meet and they discuss. Even if you remember, I don't know whether this, this institute continue with that, where they will bring uh, academics to the institute to come and serve as uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, they have a position for that in the research and technical units of the institute. I give them the kudos for that. Updates and implementation. Compliance accounting system, as one of the National University Commission for Accreditation, there is need for the implementation and evaluation of the software. Fine. If you remember, OAUC mandated that for them to calculate accounting department, they must have accounting laboratories where we are. So that this student will embrace it while they are still on campus. And now what we need is that we still need the situation where they not having, having the tool or having the software is another thing, but ability for the student to be taken through the rigorous of the software is important. It is very, very look, for example, I look at our own days in the 20, 2011 to 2012, 2012 with a world called history accounting software. But around March 2013, Sage bought over history. And we have Canadian version and American version. It's very, very important. And I use have mandated the board when the people coming for the accreditation should also be versatile in using the software. Because after the education, I don't think they use it to teach the students again. This area is very important for the implementation. Thank you for thank you for, thank you, AUC, for that uh, condition. But we as an accountant, we have to follow it up. Very, very important to the institution. Then the last one, I can come for induction. If you remember, before you can be inducted as a a chartered accountant, you must have computer literacy certificate and all that. And I also want I can to keep this work because there is need for compliance with this requirement with the proof of evidence for training to enhance practical knowledge. Because man, the practical knowledge is very, very important. There is different to do the theory, the practical knowledge will make you to have to have thorough knowledge, how it works, the recording activities. That you don't need to stress yourself, it is very important. And uh, as I said at the end of this presentation, you can see online training certificate as an evidence of proof. I'm still learning, and I will still continue to learn because anybody that stopped learning is a dead person. You can see I online through Sage University, you go there, you give training and a lot of things. Currently, I'm still under training, still on this, to so make sure that you are versatile in this, and at the end of the day. We will not be able, we will be able to embrace this and everything will elevate our institute because it's a noble institute. I want to thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, sir. Wow, that was very insightful and very deep. Participants, I can see the applaud, they're all applauding you. You did excellently well. Thank you. We're not going to let go yet. I think there are a few questions on the Q&A, so you just help answer these questions, and then I would also want to give you the vote of thanks. Should I read out the questions on the Q&A? Okay, maybe we we'll just take them one after the other, but we need to be fast about it because we are a bit behind time. Okay, Isiaka Ibrahim is saying, good morning, fellow accountants. Please, how can the institute get the details of the attendees other than through our email addresses? Isiaka, don't worry. So far, you attended this webinar. You registered and attended. We have your name and your membership number, as well as your email addresses, and we'll be getting back to you, the rich news. Then Acha Moses is saying, what are the possible impacts of young accountants abandoning the core areas of accounting practice 
while transitioning into highly disruptive and fast evolving tech roles. Did you get that question, sir? Yes. Okay. Like you're to say, can I can I respond? Yes, go ahead and respond. I then I'll, I'll say the last one, the last the other two ones. Yes. Thank you very much, Mark. You see, this is not that we are trying to neglect the core accounting value. Because let me tell you one thing: whether we like it as an accountant, this is where the world is going to. And if you fail to follow, there will be a challenge. Because that in the world, throughout the world now, people are celebrating digitalizations, and that is one of the areas of accounting too that it is very important. That is this accounting software. There is need for us to have this adequate knowledge about it, so that you now stay updated of your career and be able. You no, know, that's why you make you make changes because you cannot be a an analog accountant and want people to celebrate you. Thank you. Okay, so let me go to the next question. We have one from. Okay, was you? I hold on for. I hold on the beat for you. Was you? Let me go to um, an anonymous attendee. No, and his name is Ahmed Saga. He said, "Good morning, sir. It seems that AI has come to interrupt many industries, and accounting is no exception. Could it be seen as a threat?" And opportunity for the accountants. Thank you. Well, this is, thank you very much. This is a very good question, Ma. You see, oh, uh, when you look at it from the threats and the opportunities. Now, it will be a threat for people that fail to adopt ICT, and now be a very good opportunity for people that embrace it and they have the knowledge. No, ma. Let me tell you one thing you can ask. Last year, I went for not less than four universities to assist them in the computer accounting, of accounting system during the accreditation team. And also, you know, Boomer, so last year again, I also did the practical knowledge for this kind of webinar. You can see that one as, as an opportunity, but it's not a threat. Although I said, if you remember from my slide, that it may not, when we ask a question, I can need um, reduce, it can only reduce the number of accountants. It cannot take place of accountants because of what? Human judgment and analytical decisions. However, I will appeal to my professional colleagues to embrace this. And if you want, you there's a, what, please, have a, I showed you on the slide, that website, Sage University, is an opportunity for you to go there. And Log in and register. You will acquire a lot of knowledge. And number two, I also want to employ the institute. The practical knowledge is important. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, Oyetunji Muiwa is saying, how can I can help the young accountants to have practical experience with recognized certification in digitalization and accounting packages? Wow, thank you very okay. Sorry, Mark. Can I talk? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Thank you very much, Madam Noye. You can see now that's where you are going to. That's why I'm appealing to our Dr. Unjune Naya. Please, ma. The tech, the podcast is very important, ma. And I believe and I know the institute is capable of doing that. I'm ready to even assist in that area. The practical knowledge is important so that people will have online proof. Um, the cert in terms of certificate, that's why I show you the certificate. Because if you are, if, you, if you tell me I want to employ you, and I tell me that you have the knowledge. The first thing I'm asking that do you have the certificate? After that, I'll now take you to do what to the system to operate. So in that aspect, I want to appeal to the institute so that to join my voice with his own voice, so that the institute can look can look from that direction. Thank you, man. Mm, okay, sir. How can I can help the young accountants? Okay, I think I have read that. Wow, this Tolu Tolu Walogo is saying, ah, thank you for the detailed delivery. Please, how can I can ensure that the accounting lab in our university becomes function functioning because it has always been there for accreditation purposes. I don't think our facilitator can answer that. But probably I'll share my details on the chat. 
and probably just give me a chat and I will refer you to one of the secretarial staff. I'll be able to attend to that. So Anonymous is saying, how can accountants who find themselves in small organizations set up a standard accounting procedure? So can I say something, sir, ma'am? Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, ma'am. Fine, a small organization. You, if if at all you may not, you don't have, to, you don't, you cannot afford the software. Fine, because of the what the implementation cost. But there is something that is there free for you online. You can go and start from a particular what called Excel. With Excel, you can use it to prepare the financial reports. Very simple, so that you start the processing and procedure. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes, few minutes for us to round up the session. How can the institute be of help to those who lack practical experience? Through training, ma'am. Through training. Our chairman is here. Exactly. <laughs> so can, data analysis, <laughs> can data analysis add value to the accounting profession? Very, very important. Okay. Very important. Very, very okay. crucial. But that's very, very why we are here. That's why we are having this um, session. Exactly. Because it can enhance us, and that's why today is happening. Yeah, exactly, Ma. Unfortunately, these are far we can go with the questions because if we leave our participants, we will not, we will not take any other paper. We still have other things <laughs> to do. But I will appreciate if the facilitator can share his details, probably his email address, you know, on the platform. So that participants can, you know, ask questions, send in questions. So, do you mind? Can you they'll also get it together? when they get his slides. I think they will get his. Okay, um, they will share it. They're beautiful. Okay, so participants, yeah, participants, please bear with us. This is how far we can go for this session. So, if you have any questions, just when we send you the slide, please do well to ask him whatever questions you need to. So, let's quickly so, call on. So, Naya, before we round up with him, participants, okay. you all have. You've all heard um, Dr. Ladipo pour out his heart to us. And Dr. Ladipo, we want to say thank you very much. Um, we're proud of you as a member of the Institute. We are happy that you're doing something great at the Landmark University. And we are thanking you also for making yourself really available okay. to give us practical sessions. I noted um, the need for us to practicalize these things about being techy digitalization, then you're ready to profile yourself to help the Institute to do this. So I will be engaging you for the purpose of young accountants development. We don't just want them to hear these theories. We also want them to see some um, technicalities and some actual things just like you have just um, mentioned. So I'll come back to you, obviously. And we will be doing something together just to make sure that these young accountants get to where we want, where, where they ought to get to. So young accountants, the sky is just there for all of us to continue to move. There's nobody stopping us. AI is not stopping us. Technology is not stopping us. Mm. It's just for us to embrace it. And you will just find out that you are there. The space is there for you. So let's come, let's keep learning, let's keep engaging, let's keep mentoring after those who are who have gone way ahead of us. And you can be sure that um, your future is great and is more successful than those who are already ahead of you. So thank you. And um, thank you Noye, over to yeah. you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very thank you. much, Matt. That, that's, that's very, very encouraging. In the accountants, you can you listen to that. It's very encouraging. You're not alone on this journey. You know, you have council members, you have professionals that have gone ahead of you and they are willing to put in their best to ensure that you get to where you're going to go to. So let's quickly call on a board member to help with a vote of thanks. Even though our chairman has given thanks to our speaker, also want to, on behalf of the committee and everyone listening, let's call on Mr. Tolu Lokwe Ogunsiji. ACA to help with a vote of thanks to our speaker, Oladipo Olufemi. Sir, please, can you unmute and help with the vote of thanks? I think we're having issues, you know, during uh, the morning. Okay. okay. We Good can morning. hear you, sir. 
Good morning, Good morning sir. Professor. Good morning, my professional colleagues and senior professional colleagues. I am Ogunshi Itulokwe AC, a board member of the Young Accountants Com Development Committee. We must appreciate Dr. Oladapo Adebayo AC for teaching us on the topic of, of becoming a tech savvy accountant and embracing digitalization. You not only taught us, but raised logical points and recommendations for this. We say a very huge thank you. I must also appreciate my fellow listeners for their listening ears. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Toludokwe, for that vote, brief vote of thanks. Yes, it's time for us to go into our second paper. Like we said, we have so much in store for you today, but we're trying to work with time. Our next paper will be on sustainability reporting, the increasing importance of incorporating environmental, social, and governance ESG factors into the financial reporting. And to do justice to this paper is one of our seasoned facilitators, and she is Dr. Grace Fatube, FCA, IFRS Taxonomy Consultative. She's a member IFRS Taxonomy Consultative Group. But before we listen to her, let's quickly call on one of our council members to help read our profile. And that is Mrs. Olaito Babatunde, FCA. Ma, please can we listen? to you as you read the profile. I would appreciate if our facilitator, you know, um, activates our camera while our profile is being read. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noye. And I want to welcome every participant to this um, month's session with the YAC committee. I'm sure you know that it's been an interesting session since we started about an eye go. Um, I have the singular honor to introduce the next paper presenter. One of us is Swan member, Dr. Grace Fatogbe. Grace is a sustainability reporting leader based in Nigeria with over 20 years of experience in financial sector. She currently serves on the following board and committee. Member IFRS Taxonomy Consultative Group. Member Nigeria Adoption Readiness Working Group for Sustainability Reporting. Board Member Corporate Reporting Board of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, ICANN. She is a distinguished member of professional bodies, including fellow Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, and a certified project management practitioner. Grace owes an MSc Finance and Management from Springfield University. The MSc was financed by the British government under the Chevening Scholarship that targeted exceptionally talented candidates. I want all you all to welcome with me, Dr. Grace Fatogbe. You can agree with me that today we are privileged, we are lucky to have seasoned presenters to talk to us on the topic at hand. And talking about sustainability reporting, I don't think we can have it better discussed by anybody other than Grace. Join me to welcome her on board as I yield the floor to her to take over the section. Dr. Grace, you are most welcome this morning. Thank you for honoring our invitation. Yeah, please Thank you. Hands, your hands of applause for her. Many more rounds of applause in the air. Thank you. You are welcome, Dr. Grace. You're welcome, man. Rounds of applause. Yeah, we are happy you're here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to... Um project please can you confirm that you can see my screen my slide yes we can see it with you we, we can yes. see your slide oh excellent thank you thank you so much and um thank you for the warm welcome 
Um, Madam Chairman, thank you for the opportunity. I also thank the entire board of the Young Accountants Development Committee for the opportunity to be here today. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and it's truly a pleasure to be here with you this Saturday morning. I'm particularly impressed with the number of people that have joined us on a Saturday morning. I know there are several other places you can, you would you can possibly have been, but you've decided to be here. So for me, that is a commendable demonstration of your commitment to your personal and professional development. And I can assure you with this level of commitment to your personal and professional development, the sky is just the beginning for you. It's not even a limit. So why are we here today? I'm here today to help us explore the seamless integration of environmental, social, and governance factors into financial reporting. I hope to have equipped you with the knowledge and skills to enable you guide your various organizations to transition from traditional financial reporting into comprehensive corporate reporting. And when I talk about corporate reporting, what I simply mean is the um, incorporation of financial and non-financial dimensions in your reporting process. So I'll start off by asking a question. When we say financial reporting, what do we actually mean? Um, when you hear the term financial reporting, is this something, what comes to your mind? Um, please feel free to drop your thoughts in the chat box. When you hear financial reporting, what do you typically think of? Um, any comments from anyone? When we hear financial reporting, what comes to our mind? Participants, you can type in your answers on the chat box. Please type in your answers under the chat chat box. I'm checking. I don't think I've seen any. Okay, another not. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yeah, yes. So, excellent answers. Stewardship reporting. I think I saw um income statements. Yes, excellent. So we all understand what financial reporting is. So, essentially, financial reporting. The end product, everything has, um, if we remember our computer, sys um, computer system, you have an input, you have um, where the processing is done, and then you have an output. So if we're looking at the financial reporting process with that same lens, the output of the financial reporting process is actually financial statements. And what does the financial statement hope to provide? It hopes to provide information that is useful to make economic decisions. That is the end product. So it's not just about providing information, but it should be information that is useful for making decision. And typically, people use the outputs of the financial reporting process to make decision whether to extend resources to an entity or not. So traditionally, using the financial statements, investors are able to determine how much they would like to pay for the share of a business. And this was very okay because previously, the tangible asset was actually a significant component of an entity's assets. So if you looked at the financial statements and the total asset is, for instance, a billion naira, most likely you would be able to pay a billion naira for that business because you didn't need any other parameter to determine what the value of that business is because the entire, more than 90% of the value of that company was tangible assets. But there's now a transition, there's a change now. We now have intangible assets making up very significant portion of an entity's value. And therein lied a problem with a typical financial reporting because the typical financial reporting was focused on financial information. But investors were beginning to realize, in fact, there's a lot of empirical research that shows that there is a direct relationship between companies who, which have very good corporate social responsibility. There's a positive relationship between companies who have very good corporate social responsibility activities and their value. So it means that the more 
uh, engaged you are with the society that you help, the more profitable the business became. And then they now became a problem because what was available for investors to determine the value of a company was just financial statements. And there were more parameters beyond the financials that determines how well a business will do. So what happened was that investors now began to look for non-financial information. And if the companies themselves were not providing that non-financial information, the investors were now using their estimation to determine how to value the non-financial information of that entity. And what happened is that there was now a market valuation risk because I don't have accurate information to determine what the non-financial information of a company is. I am now making assumptions. So I may either end up overvalue or undervaluing um, a company. And when I overvalue a company, it's to the benefit of the person selling, but to the detriment of the person buying. And when I undervalue, it is to the benefit of the person buying, but to the detriment of the person selling. So we now had a gap where investors were looking for information beyond what was coming from traditional financial reporting. And so we now have a new reporting landscape where people needed more than financial um, information, yet our financial reporting process was only providing financial information. So how do we address this gap? Investors are now looking for information that are both financial and non-financial. And typically this non-financial information encompasses environmental, social, and governance issues. And the reporting of environmental, social, and governance issues are, is simply what we call sustainability reporting. So if somebody asks you, what is sustainability reporting? You simply tell the person, it is the disclosure of the environmental, social, and governance issues surrounding an organization. When we say environmental, what are we talking about? We're talking about nature. The impact an organization has on the nature and the impact nature has on its business. And think nature, we're looking at things like water, biodiversity, carbon emissions, climate change. Those are the issues we typically discuss under environmental. When we look at social, what are we looking at? It is how the company interacts with the communities around it, with customers, with stakeholders, with employees. In fact, the common um, phrase in Nigeria right now is Japa. And Japa is people who are well um, educated, prepared, and don't have the knowledge and skills leaving Nigeria to go to other countries. So that is a social issue. It means that we are losing our skilled manpower to do the work we need to do. So it means that organizations will now need to start looking at things they need to be doing differently to make sure that they don't lose their skilled manpower. And when we're talking about governance, we're referring to the systems and processes with which a company is directed, controlled, and managed. So we're looking at issues such as the board, the board composition, is the board independent or is the board just another extension of management? We're looking at things such as executive compensation. So those are the things and the kind of information that we are now required to disclose. So we're going beyond the traditional financial reporting because unfortunately, the times have changed and a significant portion of an asset's value is arising from the intangibles. And so we need information to be able to value the intangibles. So why is it important to do reporting, sustainability reporting? Why is it important to report your environmental, social, and governance issues? Apart from the one reason which I had earlier mentioned, which is the market valuation um, mismatch, where people either undervalue or overvalue you, it provides transparency. At least as long as you're disclosing that information, people have clarity and have information to appropriately determine whether they want to associate with you or not. Because there are some activities that by the time you disclose it, based on someone's value system, he may say, oh no, I don't want to deal with this business, so I'm not investing in this business. But that same information that may discourage A from investing in you could encourage B 
from to invest in you because B loves that thing that you're doing that may discourage A. Then it also helps with risk mitigation because it takes you beyond looking at just your traditional risk to look at the risk inherent in sustainability issues. And then once you're able to identify those risks, then you can mitigate them. And it's not only about sustainability related risk. It also allows you to look at the opportunities that are arising from environmental, social, and governance issues. For instance, the JAPA um, issue I just mentioned, for an organization which has an excellent um, process to retain its staff, while other people are jumping ship and leaving Nigeria, staff of such an organization would not leave. And so you've been able to use something that is ordinarily a disadvantage to other organizations to ensure that your own business continue to thrive and succeed. So we now understand what sustainability reporting is, which is simply the um, disclosure of your environmental, social, and governance issues. And we know why it is important. So let's look at the evolution of sustainability reporting. Do I just wake up and decide to report my environmental, social, and governance issue anyhow I like? Or are there standards and guidelines that guide sustainability reporting? The answer to your question is yes. In fact, there are numerous standards. And I will take us through 10 of them briefly that are international. We have the Global Reporting Initiative, which is a sustainability related standard that is concerned with the disclosure of environmental, social and governance impacts. So the focus is the impact, not necessarily is it affecting your value as a business. Then we have the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which focuses on measuring and managing greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases, there are seven of them. Um, we have carbon dioxide, we have methane, nitride oxide, and four others. But generally, people just mention carbon emissions. But there are seven gases which have been identified by the Kyoto Protocol to be greenhouse gas emitting. And when we say greenhouse gas emitting, it just means that they have the tendency to heat up the ozone layer. And we now have the carbon disclosure project, which collects environmental data, specifically carbon emissions. We have the equator principles that is focused on reporting environmental and social risk in project finance. We have the climate disclosure standards board, which focus on reporting things that has to do with climate. Then we have the carbon trust that helps organization in their effort to reduce their carbon emissions. We have the International Integrated Reporting Council that promotes integrated reporting. That is a connection between your financial and non-financial information. So we remembered, I mentioned that traditionally financial reporting was focused on financial statements, but there was a need to bring on board non-financial information. So the International Integrated Reporting Council promoted integrated reporting, which was one effort to bring information that are both financial and non-financial. We have the ISO 26000, which focus on uh, principles that have to do with social responsibility. We have the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which is focused on industry-specific sustainability reporting standards. The SASB focused, identified sustainability issues. That is, when I mention sustainability, I'm talking about environmental, social, and governance issues that are specific to businesses based on the business model they operate. So if you are in the manufacturing sector, within the manufacturing sector, you are producing alcoholic beverages. All businesses that produce alcoholic beverages are put in one industry because they have similar risk when it comes to sustainability issues. And they also have similar opportunities when it comes to sustainability issues. Then in 2015, we have the tax force for the disclosure of climate related finance, the tax force on climate related financial disclosures, which focus on providing recommendations that organizations should disclose 
the information surrounding governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets related to their climate-related risk and opportunities. Now, you would notice that we've gone through about 10 standards right now, and these 10 standards are not all the standards that govern sustainability. In fact, I read a research paper that showed that there were over 300 standards, guidelines, rules related to environmental and social, environmental, social, and governance issues. And none of these 10 standards that I've mentioned is actually a local standard. So it shows you the plethora of standards. So we have a challenge with so many standards. Back home here in Nigeria, I can mention just about five, three or four sustainability related standards. In 2012, we had the Central Bank of Nigeria issuing the Nigeria Sustainable Banking Principles. That was one standard guiding sustainability. We also had um, the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance issued by the Financial Reporting Council, which was specific to one aspect of sustainability, which is governance. We also have the um, NGX regulation, the Nigerian Stock Exchange, issuing a guideline around sustainability. We also have the Securities and Exchange Commission issuing a guideline around sustainability reporting. We can go on and on and on about the different standards that guide some form of sustainability reporting. So you can imagine with so many standards, the old adage, the too many cooks spoil the broth comes to mind to me. Which one do you choose from? In fact, recently I reviewed the um, annual report of 30 companies quoted on the tri prime board of the stock exchange. And I noticed that they were using different standards. Even among the banks that were supposed to be using the Nigeria sustainable, sustainable Banking Principles issued by the CBN, the banks will use the one issued by the CBN. They will copy the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They will copy the Global Reporting Initiative. So you can imagine comparability was an issue. So how do you now address this issue of information overload? How do you achieve comparability with so many standards? focused on different things. Some are focused on environmental, social, and governance issues, some just on governance, some just only on social, some just only on environmental. So we realize that we have a challenge with numerous standards. How, how do we address this? First, you need to bring together some of the standards so that you address market fra fragmentation and reduce the confusion of users. And to achieve that, it means that we need to streamline the over 300 standards that are available globally. And this led to some institutions that were issuing standards, sending out a joint statement that they were going to collaborate and come up with a unified standard. And those institutions that mentioned that did that joint statement, we have the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, which is very common and widely used even in Nigeria. We have the Tax Force on Climate Financial um, Disclosure. We had the International Integrated Reporting Council, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. They all issued a joint statement saying that because of the confusion with so many standards, we're going to work together to come up with a unified standard that the market can now use internationally. And this led to the merger of the Inter Integrate International Integrated Reporting Council and SASB. SASB is Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. So when I use the abbreviation SASB, I'm referring to the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. They were merged in 2000 to form the Value Reporting Foundation. And after the merger of um, IIRC and SASB to form the Value Reporting Foundation, the International Financial Reporting Foundation, IFRS Foundation at COP26 in Glasgow announced the establishment of the International Sustainability Standards Board with the mandate to develop a global baseline standard that will be used for sustainability reporting. And the ISSB, which is the International Sustainability Standards Board, then consolidated further consolidated the Climate Disclosure Standards Board with the Value 
reporting foundation into the ISSB. And this now led to the ISSB providing some sort of consolidation of market-focused sustainability-related standards. Because what we had in the over 300 standards is that some were focused on impacts. Impact is similar to corporate social responsibility. It's just doing good, whether it helps your business or not. And then you had some standards that were focused on economic useful decision. So those are the standards that the International Sustainability Standards Board merged together and then built on their work so that it will not start from ground zero. So I would like to just use a picture to show where we were before and where we're going to. So previously, there was a disconnect between financial reporting and sustainability reporting. If I ask by a, a show of hands or by typing in the chat box, since we're all finance professionals here, were we ever involved in sustainability reporting that our organizations did? The answer would most likely be no, because previously sustainability reporting was purely the forte of sustainability professionals. Accountants were not involved. And the market wanted the same rigor that we find in financial reporting into sustainability reporting because people were just reporting anything that they thought the market wanted to hear. And that gave rise to greenwashing. And greenwashing essentially is just that you are claiming to be doing something that you're not doing. Now, to bridge that gap between the disconnect between financial reporting and sustainability reporting, we now got the IFRS Foundation established the International Sustainability Standards Board with the main goal of integrating financial and sustainability reporting and giving sustainability reporting the same rigor that is available in financial reporting. And our desired state, which is where we are going to, is that we now have corporate reporting that integrates financial and sustainability reporting at the same path so that when I pick up a sustainability report of an organization, I don't have to doubt whether it, the information in there has been accurately reported and it represents facts because there is now a standard that has the same rigor as that issued by the International Accounting Standards Board. So I am rest assured that this sustainability information is not greenwashing, it represents facts and I'm able to use it to value a company. So let's now look at the landscape of corporate reporting. We have these four organizations that were previous, previously issuing different sustainability related standards merged into the IF, International Sustainability Standards and the ISSB used the various standards that they had issued, consolidated them and built upon them and brought the rigor that was in financial reporting. And then we now have the IFRS sustainability reporting standards. In June, 2023, the ISSB issued its inaugural standards. The IFRS S1, which is the general requirements for disclosure of sustainability related financial information. We'll look at the IFRS S1 next on my next slide. And the IFRS S2, which is the climate related disclosures. So let's now look at the IFRS S1. The IFRS S1 is similar to IAS1, Presentation of Financial Statement. So what it does is it provides the foundation that you will use for your sustainability reporting. The objective is that you should disclose sustainability-related risk and opportunities. Are you supposed to disclose every single sustainability related risk and opportunity? The answer is no. Paragraph 18 of IFRS S1 clearly defines materiality and you're only required to disclose material sustainability related risk and opportunity. And the definition of materiality in IFRS S1 is exactly the same as in paragraph seven of IAS1 presentation of financial statement. So when we talk about materiality, we're saying that any information that you omit, obscure or mistake that can influence the decision of an investor to extend resources to that entity. And when I use the term investor, I'm referring to general users of 
general purpose financial reporting, which is defined in IFRS S1 and IAS1 as potential and existing lenders, potential and existing creditors, potential and existing investors. So when I use the term investors, please bear at the back of your mind, I'm referring to these three categories. So the information you're required to disclose is what is material. So you don't just go and disclose every single sustainability issue. And the fact that something is material does not automatically mean, when I say material, carbon emissions is a trending topic in sustainability. And everybody will say carbon emissions is a material topic. Yes, it is a material topic in sustainability, but it may not necessarily be material for your entity. So your entity needs to do its materiality assessment to determine that carbon emissions is a material sustainability risk or opportunities before it discloses it. So you disclose what is material and material to your entity, not material as to what is trending. The next thing is the core contents. Organizations are expected to disclose their governance, strategy, risk management, metrics and targets surrounding their sustainability related risk and opportunity. If you recall, I had mentioned this earlier. This is exactly the pillars um, recommended by the TCFD that the ISS be copied and built upon. So the core content of the IFRS S1 is governance. You must disclose your governance. You must talk about the strategy that you have for managing your sustainability related risk and opportunities. What are the risk management, the processes that you use? And then finally, your metrics and targets. We'll look at the metrics and targets in detail when we get to the climate related disclosures. Um, do you just go anywhere and get guidance? The answer is no. Paragraph 54 of IFRS S1 tells you specifically the sources of guidance. Paragraph 54 refers you to IFRS sustainability standards to guide you in doing your reporting. And as of today, we only have one standard apart from the S1, which is the S2, which is climate-related disclosure. So if you're disclosing your climate-related risk and opportunities, you refer to IFRS S2. So what about if I want to talk about biodiversity or human rights? Paragraph 55 refers you to the SAS B industry-based standard. Remember, we had looked at it previously. So pending when the ISSB issues specific topics that governs biodiversity or human rights, you refer to the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board industry-specific standard to report on your other sustainability issues. The SAS B standard is a required standard that you must refer to. Uh, however, there are optional standards, there are optional guidance that the standard refers to that you may choose to refer to. One of the optional guidance is industry practice. So what are the people within my industry reporting? You can report something, you can report that kind of information. And what are the other standard setting bodies saying regarding this sustainability risk and opportunity? The standard allows you to report, for instance, what um, the Global Reporting Initiative is saying about a particular sustainability issue, as long as the focus is investors. You remember I said GRI is focused on impact, not necessarily the prospect of the um, business. Now, if that, um, start, that information, that sustainability issue is purely focused on impact, then you don't need to report it. So let's now look at the IFRS S2. The objective of the IFRS S2 is the disclosure of climate-related risk and opportunity. S1 is saying disclose all your sustainability risk and opportunities. Climate is one of the sustainability issues. S1 is now looking at how do you report on your climate-related risk and opportunities. So you are to disclose... Look, Hello. I'm sorry for interrupting. Yes, I sent you a message on the chat. You have like um, 10 minutes more to round up okay. so that we can do questions. Yes. Thank All right, you. excellent. So I'll um I'll just try and speed up. So the purpose, the objective of the IFRS S2 is that you disclose your climate-related risk and opportunities. I'd already looked at the core content. It has exactly the same core content as in S1. Let's now delve into the metrics and targets. 
you have to disclose your metrics. And what are your metrics? Your metrics are the sustainability topics. So the standard has cross-industry metrics that are relevant irrespective of the industry you operate in. And then we also have what is known as industry-based metrics. The industry-based metrics are specific to the industry you're operating in. So let's now take a look at the cross-industry metrics. There are seven of them. We have the greenhouse gas emissions. The greenhouse gas emission, you're required to disclose your scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Your scope one emission is what is coming from your direct operations for an airline business, for instance, it will be the emissions coming from the flights undertaken by the airline. Your scope two emissions are purchased electricity. So it will be the megawatt per hour of electricity that you have consumed. And then your scope three emissions are coming from your value chain, your suppliers. For organizations, for industry, for organizations that are either in the banking sector, insurance, or asset management and custodial services, IFRS X2 also requires you to report financed emissions. And what are financed emissions? Those are the emissions coming from for commercial banks, it will be the businesses that you've extend, extended loans to. For asset management and insurance companies, it will be the businesses that you have invested in. So those, their carbon emissions, is you're also required to disclose it. Then we have transition risk. Transition risk are simply the risks that are arising from the transition to a lower carbon emission economy. In Nigeria, we have the Climate Change Act 2021 that was signed off by President Muhammadu Buhari. That act introduces a carbon budget for the entire nation, which will be cascaded down to all institutions, both private and public. What that means is that when you ex um, emit carbon beyond your cap, a penalty comes in, and that penalty is called a carbon tax. So that is something you should be aware of. I will skip the physical risk, climate related, because I don't have much time. Um, but the slides will be shared with you. And then remuneration, I would like to talk about remuneration. So in your current reporting period, if any percentage of your executive remuneration is tied to climate related issues, then you should disclose that. You're required to disclose that in your sustainability report. So let's now take a look at an industry-based disclosure. You have 11 sectors. I have made the food and beverage sector number one, but it is actually arranged alphabetically because I want to take a case study of the food and beverage sector. For each of these sectors, you have a number of industries in them. So let's look at the industries presented under the food and beverage sector. There are seven of them. There are seven of them. And we have what is known as the industry-based um, guidance. They are in volumes. You have volume one to 68. For the sector, for the industries within the food and beverage sectors, you find their disclosure between volume 20 all the way to 26. My focus is the non-alcoholic beverage, which is volume 24. So would look at what you're expected to disclose if you are a non-alcoholic beverage um, company. You may want to ask, what about if I um, produce both alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages? What it simply means is that you'll be looking at volume 21 and volume 24 to do your reporting. If you are also a business that has done backward integration, that you're involved in agricultural processing of your product farming, what it means is that you look at volume 20, 21, and 24 when you're doing your reporting. But for the purpose of my case study, I'm only using non-alcoholic beverage. So for a business that in, is involved in non-alcoholic beverage production, you have five uh, mat metrics that the standard has identified as being material to that industry. Remember, it does not automatically become material to you. You have to do your materiality assessment. So I've done, I've picked about four out of these five to say a material to a hypothetical um, business. So let's look at what this business will be reporting. It will be reporting the amount of fuel it has consumed and what percentage is renewable among that. It will be reporting the energy it has consumed, the percentage that is coming from um, the grid and the percentage that is um, renewable. 
when we look at uh, water management, it's to tell us the total of water it has withdrawn and what it has consumed, because there might be a difference between what it has withdrawn and what it has consumed. And then ingredients, where do you source your ingredients? Are you sourcing it from a place where there's a high baseline water stress area? So those are the kind of information you'll be required to disclose. I'm sorry I had to rush because I've run out of time. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you very much for listening to me. I can be reached via my email. I have a YouTube channel where I break down sustainability issues. If you want, you could subs um, log in and watch and I can be reached on LinkedIn. So thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Ma. That was an excellent delivery. Wow, we appreciate you so much. You did excellently well. I can see the accolades on the chat box. They appreciate seeing you. Probably just take, okay, maybe just one or two questions and then others can send you an email. Quickly, I have one from an anonymous attendee saying, I am a follower or large day. Okay, that's his name. All protocols you do observe. Thank you so much for this insight about sustainability reporting. Please, how does this type of reporting template look like? Who is responsible for its preparation? What will signal its preparation? And who is and are beneficiaries of this type of report? Okay, so um, I think those are several questions in one. Um, the first thing mm -hmm. I'd like to start off is... Um, the Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria has actually already adopted that Nigeria will be adopting the IFRS sustainability yes. standard. I don't know. Can I go ahead? There's some sort what of... Uh, yes. Yeah, so the Financial, so the financial yes. Reporting Council of Nigeria has adopted... Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going so, yeah. so, so sorry about that, Ma. Let's quickly mute. Right. Okay. Secretary, please, can you mute everyone? Secretary, please Okay. Uh, help us mute okay. so that... All right. So to answer your question, um, one, there's a mandatory requirement to use the IFRS S1 and S2 in Nigeria. The Financial Reporting Council has actually mandated that we will be adopting the IFRS sustainability standards. We The adoption will be in four phases. We have early adopters. The early adopters are those who have opted to adopt early, and those are they will be reporting their first sustainability reports using the IFRS sustainability standards in 2024 based on their 2023 performance. Then you have a period of voluntary adoption between 2024 all the way to 2026, and by 2027, there will be mandatory adoption. So all organization, including SMEs, are required to adopt the IFRS sustainability standards. And to another of your question, who is responsible for preparing this? You would realize that some of the information required for preparing this sustainability report is beyond the expertise of accountants. So there will be a collaboration between accountants and sustainability experts within the organization. For instance, one, um, one of the data you need for computing your carbon emissions are for scope two, the megawatt hours of electricity consumed. Ordinarily, I don't think that's an information that is domiciled within the financial reporting process. So it means you now need to liaise with your admin or maintenance people to be collating that data. So you have to make them aware that you require this data and they need to collate it. And then when it comes to uh, for time for you to prepare it, you now need to work together with them to get the data from them and then now do the um, sustainability reporting. So the short answer to your question is, it's going to involve a lot of stakeholders within the organization. HR will have responsibility for things that have to do with maybe um, diversity, inclusion, um, human rights. So you're going to work with several stakeholders within the organization. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Ma. Quickly, the next person, Isia Kabame Delay, say where the company fails to comply with ESG, despite the auditor's report indicating omission of ESG materiality in accordance with the standards. What is your position on this, Ma? I don't know if you get that. Yes, I, I do. So the thing is that it's now beyond the auditor telling the company you must disclose those ESG issues. As I mentioned, the Financial Reporting Council has actually said we are adopting. And you remember that you submit your accounts to the Financial Reporting 
reporting cancel. So if the company refuses to report material, so, um, environmental, social, and governance issues, there will be penalties from the Financial Reporting Council. So there will be a penalty from the Financial Reporting Council. And apart from the penalty from the Financial Reporting Council, the company will suffer market valuation risk because people can either over or undervalue the shares of that entity. So if it's an entity that is listed, it's to the benefit of the company to do that disclosure. Okay. Okay, that's a good one. Achamos, he said, can we have a practical glimpse of how ESG data are reported and presented on the FS? Um, the, the My last two slides before the end is actually what, that was what I showed. That's what you'll be reporting. That's what you have in your sustainability report. You, so you see the metric where I have the fleet fuel consumption and then the amount you consumed. Some of the disclosure will be qualitative, some will be quantitative. The standard, by the time you go to the volume, it shows you clearly whether the information will be quantitative or qualitative. And there's also a technical protocol that shows step-by-step step how you report that information. So that table, those two tables I showed, I don't know if I can quickly share my screen and show it again, is actually what it will look like in your sustainability reports. Uh, sorry, let me put it on slideshow. So this is what it will look like. So you can see the um, fuel consumed, the percentage that is renewable. And then if you want to give any additional disclosure, this is what it will look like. So this is a sample of what it will look like. In an instance where it is quantitative, like in this case of waste management risk and strategy, this is purely qualitative. So this you use narratives to report it. And I want to point out that um, this is the first time globally the IFRS sustainability standards are being adopted. So nobody has even... Okay. Nobody you, has done any in this standard. So we're all learning, Nigeria mm -hmm. and the whole world, we're all working together. Okay, ma. Okay, I think maybe we'll just take a final one. Um, do we have companies with sustainability reporting disclosures in Nigeria since 2012 to date? And how yes, can I do. assess the data? How can that data um, be assessed? Okay, um, for those that are listed, if you go to their website, you would see it. Like I told you, I just recently reviewed the um, annual reports of 30 companies on the prime board of the Nigerian Stock Exchange. So I can mention some of their names. If you go to their website, search, you will find their sustainability reports. You would also find some a summarized version of their sustainability reports embedded in their annual reports. You can check UBA, you can check MTN, Airtel, just look for companies that are listed and you go to their website, you can find it. And I'm sure if you um, reach out to the Nigerian Stock Exchange, they will be able to also share that information with you. Okay, so what's the relationship between ESG and CSR? Okay, so um, CSR just takes one element of ESG. If you remember the meaning of CSR is corporate social responsibility, social. So it's focusing on your impact on communities. But ESG is looking beyond just the social. It is incorporating environmental, social, and governance factors. So corporate social responsibility is just one, set, one subset of ESG. Okay, unfortunately, because the more I keep reading, the more the questions keep flooding in. But unfortunately, because of time, these are how we can go for the Q and A on this particular session. So, like we did with the other, the first um, um session, won't appeal to participants. If we didn't take your question, we sincerely apologize about that. But not to worry, you can send our facilitator an email. And I'm sure they're definitely going to answer to all your inquiries. So the slides will be shared both all, for all papers today. The slides will be shared to everyone that registered and attended the webinar. So let's quickly call on another board okay, member. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. Um, Grace, you've been amazing. Thank um, you. <laughs> I know everyone has gained a lot from listening to you. The insights you've shared 
um, our new world us right now. Um, I guess whoever didn't understand what um, sustainability reporting was before now has um, some major understanding of what it should be. Yes, they may not be able to plug their hands into it practically, but um, their mindsets, their insights has um, improved so far. So um, thank you very much for helping us see that it's an investor thing. The investors want to know beyond, when, when it comes to making the investments from both sides, but that, whether the investor or whoever is wants to value their business, you want to know whether you actually, you're pricing yourself rightly or wrongly. And so sustainability reporting helps you get it done well, helps you do a more robust um, um, valuation of your business. So it's important we know this. It's important we also know how to actually get on the right numbers and what we need to be doing as a business in our organizations um, to ensure that we are moving with the trend, the trend where financial reporting is going to now is not only financial anymore, it's beyond financial. And that comes with the social, the corporate governance, the governance issues, the environmental issues. So for we all just have to be responsible. We're not just responsible for creating numbers. We are responsible to ensure that our environment, our impact on our environment is not adverse, but actually as we have adverse effects, we also improve in our environment in one way or the other. So thank you, Grace. I know that we are going to see you some other time. And I know that you can all see Grace is a very young person and she's full of wisdom, a lot of wealth in what we do not know. So young accountants, just let us give her a round of applause again for honoring us this morning and um, giving us the best of what she can this today. So thank you, Grace. And um, I'll bring up Tolu Lokwe, are you there? So help yes, us. Yes, Maya. Beautiful lady that has impacted so much on us. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning once again, my professional colleagues and senior professional colleagues. I am Ogunshi Tolokwe ACA, a board member of the Young Accountant Development Committee. We must appreciate Grace Patogwe, FCA, for teaching us on the topic sustainability reporting, the increasing importance of incorporating ESG factors into financial reporting. We, I, um, I would say the major thing I got to, I, I understood from our, our teachings was that investors need uh, need to be able to be carried along with happenings or the activities of the companies, even on the society, and how they impact the society positively or adversely. We must thank, we must also thank my uh, fellow listeners for their listening. Yes, um, thank you all. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you. I think a quick one from uh, Maria Moore. She said, thank you so much for the insightful session. She said you just made sustainability so simple to understand and that she has a lot to talk about sustainability now. Much appreciated. Just so you know, my very big thank you to you for doing X. I can see all the love from the chat box and the accolades. Yeah, we really, really appreciate you. Thank you for sharing wealth of experience on the subject matter. Yes, I think we should go on a short break based on our calendar or our time, our program. We've been sitting and listening. So let's go on a screen break, a leg break, a tea break, food, whatever break you call it. Just make sure you stand up and take a break. And so this is 12-11. We'll come back at 12 -11. Exactly, 12.15, just three minutes. It's enough for us to have a short break. And exactly 12.15, we'll be back to round up on the last session. Thank you. We'll see you every one of us very soon. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.
So we are back. We are back and um, I hope you had a break. I hope you stood up from your seats. <laughs> All right. So we go on to the next. We have another presentation and yet one. We have two more presentations to go. Nonye, are you there? Yes, I'm here, ma'am. Okay, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Like our chairman said, we have uh, one more paper and then we'll have a panel discussion on mentoring insight. But before we do that, let's call, we'll be delving into, our next paper will be on diversity and inclusion, promoting diversity within the accounting profession and fostering inclusive workplace. And also to do justice to this paper is Dr. Bolua Tife Bolua Dele, FCA. She's a principal consultant. of our next speaker, Oluwatife Oluwadili. Ma, over to you, ma. Thank you so much, Noye. The chairman, very distinguished um, YAG's team and our very wonderful participant, the young accountant. Thank you for this privilege to have the citation of this amazing SMAN. We just finished having a SWAN, an amazing SMAN. Please, I give your indulgence. I want to be off video. I'm trying, I'm having a little bit of network glitch so that it will not stop me on the way. So I'm going to take the citation of our next and final paper presentation for this March webinar. Dr. Bolua Tife Oluwadele is a chartered accountant, public policy scholar, management strategist, diligent fraud investigator, writer, and author, a trainer with considerably management, consulting, taxation, human development, and business advisory. He is also a corporate governance expert. He was educated at Walden University, USA, Leeds, Beckett University, Leeds, United Kingdom, and Federal College of Education, Katsina, Nigeria. He holds a PhD in public policy and administration. He founded Bolatife Oluwadele and Co. Chartered Accountants and Bolko Consulting in Nigeria. He manages Libromal Consulting Incorporated Canada and a new baby, the Village Boy Academy to develop young writers and prospective authors. He has served in various capacities with ICANN, such as member, professional practice and monitoring committee, PPMC, deputy chairman, technical and subcommittee of PPMC, chairman, ad hoc committee on TCI, member of practicing license review subcommittee, MCPE program drafting, regular paper presenter at MCPE consultancy sector, facilitator at the forensic accounting certification. is also a pioneer technical committee award winner for ICANN Canada International Accountants Conference. He is also a member audit investigation and forensic accounting faculty board. He is ex officio, is a current ex officio of ICANN Canada and District Society. is a two-term member of advisory board of the Association of Fraud Examiner, Examiners, ACFE. Dr. Oluwadele is a regular columnist for Premium Times and the Guardian newspaper, Nigeria, and the author of Thought of a Village Boy. He is now called The Village Boy, derived from his famous book's title. He, he also has other books to his credit, My Quest for Nigerians Rebirth, 
Audidity of Impunity and Business Strategy Manual. He has contributed to academic as a published author as well. He has, to his credit, close to a dozen publications to date. He lives in Canada and with his entire family. Very distinguished participant, permit me to welcome, to make his presentation, our erudite scholar and doctor, Bolatife Oluwadele, FCA, CFA. Sir, you are welcome to have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Again, again, I people continue to misspell my name. Uh, I always complain about that. I'm Bolutife, not Boluwatife. I hope we take that note of that. Uh, can you give me permission to share my this thing? Do I have permission to share? Okay, good. You have been uh, given, sir. Okay, given. thank you. Good morning from here. Uh, from the snowy city of Calgary, Canada. It is still 5.22 a.m. here. Uh, i very impressed by the number of turnout here. It shows on the weekend, uh, instead of going for Wambe to come and uh, learn, it's a very impressive um, you know, thing to, to behold. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed the last... Um, the last presentation as well. So taking off from there, uh, considering the effect of globalization today, the subject matter of diversity and inclusion has become more than relevant, you know, ever. So everywhere people move, there's high mobility of labor, and uh, that means there is interaction of cultures. There's, there's intersection of people of diverse background, diverse culture, and therefore it is imperative that we begin to talk about diversity and inclusion. And we do know that it is this that promote, uh, you know, a, 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 a healthy working environment, a work, a, a work, a healthy working, you know, workplaces. Without diversity, without inclusion, then there will be a lot of, uh, issue in the workplace. Today, everybody seems to be recognized, to be respected, not necessarily because of their whatever limitation that their background may offer them, but because they are human. So the humanity of their person requires them to be respected. So that is why we talk about diversity and inclusion. When we start from our normal thing, uh, accounting, no, our foundation is based on debit and credit. We say you debit the receiver and you credit the giver. That's the fundamental of accounting. But we say those who are the receiving end, those who are the ugly side of diversity, uh, which is the which is a bit contrary to our principle of debit and credit. But again, the bank statement also that statement is about um, is in conformity with what we receive in the bank. In the bank which is the converse of this case of uh, debiting the receiver and credit the giver. They debit the debit the giver and credit the receiver. So if you are receiving uh, urgent 2K, that is you that is credited. The guy that is giving you urgent 2K is debited, which is like uh, the opposite of what we do with our cash book. So when you are the receiving end of diversity, meaning that when you are discriminated against, the opposite of diversity is to be an inclusion is when you are discriminated against. Those who have suffered discrimination will tell you that how important diversity and inclusion it is to them. But for those who dish out by what we call unconscious bias and discrimination, they may not know the effect of not being diversified in the workplace. So that is what we are going to be looking at. And we are going to look at the what you know? What we think that I mean could be done to ensure that we have a very diversified workplace, especially as it concerns the accounting profession. Of course, we know the purpose of Nigeria accountant. We play a pivotal role in the shape of the economy's landscape of our nation. Our role is very significant from beginning to the end. The budgeting, the 
I mean, running of businesses and all that. We know we play this role, but how diversify is our workplace? For instance, in the last one week, I mean, some few days ago, it was on social media, how many women are, are head of banking sector, banking organization in Nigeria, which is a very welcome news. But if you go deep into those um, those statistics, you want to dig deeper. So what are the makeup of these women? Is it possible that many of them attended the same university? Oh, did they all have first class? So when you look at all these other matrices, you, you now begin to wonder how diversified they are. Then what is even the proportion of female MDCEO to the I mean, to the number of uh, bank institutions that we have in Nigeria? Of course, we know that there's an improvement, but are we there, are we yet fully diversified? So those are the factors you begin to, to look at. So to excel and to drive sustainable growth, last picture was talking about sustainability, you have to ensure that you bring everybody into the picture. Remember, I don't know many of you are, are supposed to be young accountant, but I remember the days of your everybody come inside. Forum, Forum Finance, you know, in case that then there was this advert played by, I think, Papi Lue, say everybody come inside. So an inclusive environment, you know, is what a guarantee sustainability. When there is no inclusion, sustainability is in jeopardy, it's threatened because it means you are alienating, you know, a vital part of your workforce. So that is one of the things that we should be mindful of. So it is therefore imperative for us to embrace diversity and inclusion so that we can unlock so many hitherto on top uh, potentials. Of course, that also promotes innovation. When you bring more people, people are more innovative. In Nigeria, for instance, let's say the banking sector again. Sorry, I'm not just um, uh, uh, being too particular about the banking sector. I know for at a particular point in time, if you don't have two, two, you cannot get a job in the banking sector. And we do know also that there are many factors that are responsible for the grade you have in school. It's not necessarily a test of your competence or intelligence. So by, by, by creating this kind of artificial barrier against other people, you are denying yourself, you know, the pool of resources, the pool of talents that will enhance, you know, innovation and creativity in your organization. And you are weakening, the, I mean, of, of consciously weakening your organization, the kind of resilient organization you would have otherwise built, you are denying yourself by, you know, uh, and not allowing everybody or by shutting the door against a segment of people. For instance, today, even within the accounting sector, even when all of us are general accountants, we still have a kind of discrimination. You have uh, BS, those who have BSc, those who have HND, then lately those who, who came through the rank of ATS. So when you create this artificial barrier, when you don't embrace inclusion, you are deliberately, you know, deny yourself, you know, a stronger pool of talent that could enhance innovation and creativity. So it is important, that, like there was an analysis, you know, by McKinsey, which says people organization that are diverse, especially when it becomes a term of gender-based, cultural diversity, ethnic diversity. Yes, Nigeria is, is a country, one country, but then we have our ethnic issue. In your organization, me, maybe in audit firm, do you have, does everybody from ethnic group have access to, to be employed, to be promoted? Can somebody who join an audit firm with eight years and become a general accountant, can he become, can he eventually become a managing partner in that firm? So there are so many things you, do, you look, those organizations that embrace all these differences, they are the one that they outperform. They have performed non-diverse companies on profitability because you are able to bring diverse talents, diverse innovations, diverse creativity. You are able to bring them together. But when you are by there are some organizations you go to now, if you are not from a particular school or institution, the likelihood of being a gay or employee is, is, is limited. 
If you go to, a, to an interview and the head of the panel is from a particular institution, and you and the other people who have been interviewed, well, only one of you is from his institution, there's every likelihood that the person who employed, the person who attended the same school with him or her. This is not diversity. This is discrimination. Yes, we call it unconscious bias. You are you, you are consciously biased the person that looks like you. It is not necessarily in color. It could be you are from the same community. It could be you are from the same school. You attend the same church. You are you pray in the same mosque. You are from the same state. You are from the same local government. There are so many factors that could create unconscious bias. So you need to be a bit more conscious that okay, an organization that will thrive is is the one that is well diverse, the one that is not discriminating against anybody based on these factors of ethnicity, of culture, of, you know, uh, the kind of certificate you have and all that. And when you look at, you know, diversity, what, what are those reasons for accounting diversity? There are so many factors here, like you see, things that interact with one another. We don't live in an isolated world. Nobody, no profession live, lives in isolation of one another. You have the legacy legal system, and there is common law, codified law, which mainly derived from Roman law. Or you have source of financing coming from family members, your first, you know, income, whatever come from your maybe it's your father that pay for your for, for your tutorial, for your exam fee, for your ever whatever. Then the banks, the creditors, government, stakeholder, stakeholder taxation, inflation, all these issues affect our operation at workplace. Even inflation, somebody, I mean, like we have now, which may affect even uh, employee performance in the organization and all that. So when people are more impacted than, 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 than one another. So when you look at all the issues together, you discover that it is not good at all to discriminate against anybody. So not even in any profession. So you have to look at values desire to hold, individualism, power distance, or certainty avoidance and masculinity. All these issues are things that could create discrimination. They are things that when also when they were managed, they can create inclusion too as well. For instance, if I'm a German and I come to Lagos, I want to work in the top, in the big four. Why should I be denied? The fact that I, I mean, I have, uh, I mean, I grew from eight years to become a general accountant should not be a factor for not engaging me, for not for me not becoming a managing partner in an organization, or for not getting a job in the bank. The fact that not everybody has a placement to go to university, many have to go to polytechnics. Why are we still discriminating between HND holders and BSC holders, even when they are all chartered accountants? If I engage, if I'm a Yoruba man, I engage a, 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 an Iboma or an Ijoma in my, in my organization, for instance, and if they don't greet me good morning, they will greet or they don't proceed to greet me like they, my fellow Yoruba man would do, why should I discriminate against them because of that? Is that I educate them about the culture? If they are not comfortable with it, that should not be a basis for assessing them. So when we understand all this, the interaction between all this legal system, taxation, financial system, inflation, political and economic system, and culture, they all interact to create a diverse organization, a diverse society. And a kind of profession operate within a diverse society. So that diversity to reflect in our organization. Here, recently my study was on diversity among the black uh, ski workers in Canada. And you dis I discovered a lot of insight when I was carrying out that study. Back home in Nigeria, it's the same thing as some, as some company now you go to, you see people that work in that place, they may be almost from the same local government or from the same state, a few from other states. 
there are some states even in Nigeria that people from other states cannot work, you know, in their civil service. That is not, that is discrimination. That is lack of diversity. So because of this interaction that we cannot do anything against, it is important that we have diversity in even our profession as well. So why is it important to have diversity? It's not just, diversity is not just about representation. What is representation? Representation is that, okay, we have many, um, uh, we have five people, we just employ new, five new employees, two women, three men. That's just representation. Well, where are they from? Well, do they have equal access to, do, do, do they have equal access to training? Do they have, do, have, do they have equal access to promotion? Or we just, we just employ some people to balance equation. Do we give them ability to exhibit their talents? Can they drive, do we allow them to drive innovation? Are they involved in the decision making process? Sometimes it is, it is, it is, it is simple to say, oh, we have, um, we employ people from every state of the Federation. Oh, we are, we, we, we are observing federal character, which is a form of diversity actually. And inclusion, but what is the what is the integrity of that diversity? For instance, if you have um, uh, only people from certain states or certain geopolitical zone become um, senior managers or AGM, the others they are you, you know you find people they are in the locator. I mean senior accountant, uh, accountant, payroll accountant, and all stuff like that. They cannot. No advance beyond that. So you are just talking about representation and not talking about you know true diversity. And of course, our profession thrives on the change of diverse perspective. There are so many perspectives to every issue. And that gives us room to creatively solve problems and serve our clients better than before. So there are a lot of research about consistently showing that teams that are diverse, they perform better. For instance, if you want to play football, all of us love football, if you put all left-footed people on the feet, that's going to be a disaster. So it's going to mark the right angles. If you put all defenders there, yes, they may not score you, but you may also not score. So you will see a combination, you see striker, you see midfielder, you see defender, you see, then you have a goalkeeper who is the lead in, a, in defense. So it's the same thing in an organization. You have various people with various talent, with various you know, uh, creativity to be able to get more a robust organization, even in terms of profitability. Because when you bring, they say two good results are better than one. Emphasis on good. The more diverse you are, the more access you have to creativity and innovation. So it is very important to note that, yes, when we are diverse, we get more results. We get better results. So what is your, I mean, what is the inclusion and diversity in an accounting? How do we say we have an inclusive accounting? It goes beyond, like I said, representation. It's about creating an environment where individuals feel valued. Am I just an employee? Am my opinion respected? Am I me? And am I power and power to contribute? Can I make suggestions without me? without a fear of repressor. Will I be in the denied promotion because I made a suggestion that did not go down well with the management or with the senior executive? It is not enough to say, okay, I have people from various places. Do we, are we, do, are we deliberately cultivating inclusive culture where everybody voices are heard and their perspective are valued? Yes, they may not be accepted all the time, Especially with raw contrary, if it's going to derail from a purpose, but are they valued? Do you shut them up and say, okay, well, no, no. 
We don't need your, we don't need your advice. We have taken our decision. No, that's not how to manage inclusion. And when you foster inclusivity, what do you do? You are unleashing more potential of diverse talents. Yes, we may all be a cattle, but we have various talents. Many of us can sing very well. Many of us are good on me, are better than one another on computer, on IT. Many are good, you know, in terms of managerial, many are good in cursing. Many, I, I used to tell my colleagues, look, gone are the days when they tell us at Catan we are jack of all trade and master of all. That is a fallacy. There are areas that you are competent. There are areas that I can be more competent than you. So when we include, when we embrace inclusivity, we are allowing people to come into their I mean, to come up with their core competence to contribute to the growth of the, of the organization. So that is what that, those are the advantage. Those are the, those are the benefits. The beauty of uh, inclusion. Of course, what is the, the landscape in diversity accounting? Like individuals from other represented backgrounds. I mentioned some of them. Some organization today, when there is an interview, they say, okay, if you don't have a BSc, we cannot employ you. Even if you have your AC, even if you have even reason to have to become FC. So we say, oh, we cannot do anything to you because you your background is ATS. You don't have a degree, you don't have HIV, you only have ATS, and you become a general accountant. So you see, many of these people, they are they, they you know, we begin to treat them as half miners. Or you are from mandatory, you are not from the three major tribes in Nigeria. So it's difficult for you to employ it, to be employed. Because in our CV, we have to see our state of origin. Even by looking at your state of origin, they put your CV aside. That, and that's, you know, you begin to discover that people from about, only, only about centers rise to the pinnacle of their career, which should not be so. It means we are not fully diverse. The term discrimination could come because of, okay, they are from ethnic and cultural minorities. Even within the, the same um, ethnic group, we have minorities as well. And some of these are underrepresented because if you don't have, if you don't know somebody from your village or from your local government, who is a partner in a firm? Can you just mean? What is the chances? What is your chance of being engaged or being employed by in that firm? And there are a lot of states, I mean, there are a lot of studies across the globe that shows that there are lack of representation by, you know, of other underrepresented minority, which you call URMs. It's even happening in Nigeria. I mean, uh, I, until recently, I mean, I practiced for for just several decades in Nigeria, so I understand these issues. But the more diverse we become, the better for us, for the profession, the better for our organization. So we have to first understand what is the current situation in terms of diversity. That we are from the same country doesn't mean we, the issue of diversity does, is not important to us. It is important to us. Though we say, yes, you cannot get anything unless you have connection in Nigeria. That, is, mean, that means we are not fully diverse in our workplace. If I must know somebody before I could be engaged in an organization, that is no diversity. So it will continue to be somebody who knows somebody that will continue to have opportunity. That's discrimination. That's unconscious bias. If, if I'm discriminated because, oh, I have HND or I have ATS, it doesn't matter whether all of us are shadow accountants. That is discrimination. So if we look through organization, head of departments, account departments, and we discover that all those who grew up, who came through the rank of ATS, none of them become head of department in account section. 
that is underrepresentation. So those people, they constitute URIMs because of their background. So it's not only in, in terms of ethnicity, it's also in terms of certification now. Because I am aware that there are a lot of this discrimination about certification in Nigeria. People even with Asian they are forced to go and do conversion course to obtain BS because they are deliberate, the system is deliberately limiting them. Those are the issues that our county profession should start addressing, especially at the institute level. So what are the barriers to inclusion? Various barriers, you know, include diverse talent within accounting uh, profession of firms, organization, department, which have measures on their unconscious bias in recruitment. When somebody, when you are interviewing people, say, oh, where did you use school? Oh, I'm from, uh, I, I went to Great Tiffa. Oh, good, good, good. The person has passed. Oh, I'm from ABU because the person interviewed is from ABU. You have passed. That's discrimination. That's unconscious bias. Oh, uh, the person I'm from, Yabatek. Good, good, good. And because of that, the person is engaged. Because of that, the, the promotion, even the person moves faster than other people. Irrespective of their competent level of competence, all these create barriers to inclusion. It also this barrier also impede career advancement. Sometimes even for for training for you know uh, training development, some of these issues may lead to other people are not nominated. Somebody is nominated for training three times a year; others are neglected. Some are not promoted for five years because of this unconscious bias. It's unconscious because you don't know that you are even doing it. It's only the person at the receiving end that knows. And this, of course, when you begin to discriminate against the person, the person's performance begins to decline. And you may turn out to even blame the person for not performing well not knowing that it's because of the discrimination this person is suffering that is limiting his performance or our performance. So it is important in our provision that we begin to think, how do we address this barrier? By fostering, by deliberately fostering inclusive environment. We are professional, general academy, for instance, irrespective of their background can thrive and contribute to the of our profession. Well we don't we don't create a, this artificial barrier. Everybody that is a shadow accountant has passed the exam. Even if you start the exam with school sat, so far you pass and you become a shadow accountant, you are a shadow accountant for crying aloud. Why must you be discriminated against? Because oh you did not go to, even if you go to even if, with BS is a which school? Which university do you attend? Even it, it, it may even interest you that even okay, if you attend uni like for instance, they will ask you, okay, uh, did you attend regular school or DLI? Distant learning. So you did it, oh okay. That's even a subtle discrimination along that side. So all these issues are things which you if you are a manager, if you are a recruiter. These are things you should be conscious about. We, we have to, through concerted effort, break that barrier. So how do you promote it? Strategy for promoting diversity and inclusion. You have to establish proactive strategies, aiming at equate, creating equitable and welcoming workplace. What is an equitable place? If you are good, you are good. If you are competent, you are competent. If there is an aptitude test, if you pass, you pass. The fact that you are looking for a shadow accountant, a shadow accountant, ordinarily is a shadow accountant. They should be given equal opportunity. 
irrespective whether they they became shattered uh, as the BSC holder or as HND holder or as an ATS ATS holder. It doesn't matter. It should not matter. People should not be denied opportunity because of their background. People should, the workplace should embrace everyone. If you say you are looking for shadow accountant, then if anybody applies to shadow accountant and is qualified and is competent, engage him or her. This challenge may include inclusive recruitment practices. Yes, which is what I'm saying. Don't discriminate based on the school attended, based, based on the, the certificates, you know, the previous, the certificate you have prior to becoming a general accountant. Provide diversity training for all staff. Let all staff understand the cultural differences. If your organization, you may be for instance, you have your firm in Lagos. The way they do things in Lagos is different from when you have your firm in Port Harcourt. I went to do consulting job in Port Harcourt. I discovered that the attitude, the approach to the workplace is different. So I have to learn. If I want to deal with them the way I would deal with people in Lagos, definitely things will not work out. So when you have people of diverse background in your organization, you have to deliberately train them on diversity. That should be a train, if I don't the orientation, that should be a curriculum that teaches work new employees about diversity. Because this is an imperative set of the globalization that we, we have now. When you talk about Japan and all this, you have to understand this before you Japa already, even actually, because you are going to meet people whose culture are different from yours. So you have to learn to understand their culture and respect their culture as much as also they ought to understand your culture and respect your culture. So there should be mentorship program for people that were not it at all, you know, well represented. You can't Hello, continue sir. to discriminate against them. Yes. Hello, sir. So Hello. sorry for cutting. You're so sorry for cutting me, but you have like 10 minutes more to round up. So that we can okay, take I'm, one or two. I, I, I will go. Thank you. I will go through it quickly. Thank so you. So by sir. embracing all these strategies, you can unleash the full potential of diverse talent pool, drive innovation, and get better results, better performance. Of course, there is leader, there's leadership role. Leaders play a major, a major role in diversity and inclusion. Inclusive leadership play a vital role. Without leadership support, without leadership binding, it becomes very difficult. Because of the decision point are going to be you know, authorized by the leaders. So when you see the body language of the leader would indicate whether they are interested in diversity or they are not. If in your firm or your organization, the people you bring are people, your people from your village, your in-law, people from your local church, people from your local mosque, and the people you want to employ alone, then that leader doesn't understand diversity. So leadership play a critical role in diversity and inclusion. If you are in a leadership position, don't neglect this, the importance of diversity. So, and when you, how do you create inclusive workplace? It is something you have to do deliberately. It's a deliberate effort on your part on the part of the organization, on the part of the leader, where individuals feel welcome. Oh, uh, that my boss does not like me because I'm not from his tribe. Oh, we are from the same because I'm not from his local government. People of his local government, they don't used to like us. That should not be the case. You should be welcome. You should be respected. You should be enabled to contribute fully without hindrance. So you should... One of the key things to allow open communication, celebrating diversity through cultural awareness events. Sometimes me, people say, okay, uh, next week we are going to dress like you, on Friday we dress like you, then the next Friday we dress like Igbo, the next Friday we dress like Ijo. 
and stuff like that. They do it in school. They do it in this primary and secondary school. And we have to deliberately address unconscious bias through training and education. I think maybe, I don't know, I would suggest MCP to also include in their curriculum the issue of unconscious bias because diversity has become a global issue now. So by creating a, a, the environment, then you can unlock the potential of your work for entire workforce and drive greater innovation and sources. Look at the end results. They are, they, they are, they are better results for you, wait, waiting for you if you can take the right few step of embracing diversity and inclusion. If we stop discriminating against people, we call it our country because we sometimes we don't even know that we are discriminating. It's only the person that is feeling it that knows that, oh, he's being discriminated against. That is why it's called unconscious bias. So how do you measure that you are doing something? You have to do tracking and measuring progress. How, you, how, prog how progress are you, what progress have you made from last year to, to, to this year? Then you have to you know, establish some uh, key metrics and performance indicator that include diversity representation across all levels of the organization, employee satisfaction and engagement, and promotion rate for individuals from underrepresented background. You have to know, you have to keep, how many people do we promote to managerial position today, I mean this year? How many people that are working for 10 years and they have not received any promotion? So you, then you start correcting those anomalies. You have to monitor these metrics not just establishing them, you have to, to, to monitor them to ensure that they are doing what you, you intend them to do. They are achieving what you intend them to achieve. So in that case, you continuously improve strategies to ensure that diversity and inclusion remain top priorities in your recruitment, in your promotion, in your training. So in conclusion, promoting diversity within their country and fostering inclusive workplace are critical steps towards building stronger, more resilient organization. This cannot be overemphasized. The more you do it, the more robust organization will, will produce. By embracing diversity and inclusion, accounting firms or accounting organization, accounting department can drive innovation, enhance decision making, if I'm, free, if I'm free to contribute, I will do a study. I make sure that whatever contribution I'm making is, is based on solid ground. People will work harder and better serve their clients. There are some organizations, even when they serve no, uh, the complaint of, of the clients, they don't even tell the managers because they believe they will not listen to them. So let us commit to taking concrete actions to promote diversity. It's something we have to be deliberate about. We need deliberate and consistent action. It's not just rhetorics. Before we can achieve diverse and inclusive organization, we must take concrete action to promote diversity and foster inclusion within our profession. Ensure that every individual, regardless of background, regardless of background, very important, has the opportunity. You are given opportunity to thrive and contribute to our collective success, to the collective success of the organization. If I'm denying opportunity because of my background, how can I contribute? Even when I'm given the opportunity, which is mere representation, but I am denied. Uh, access to qualitative quality training and deny access to promotion. How can I contribute meaningfully? There are there, there are so many talents out there being wasted because they are constantly denied opportunity. A part of denied opportunity, for instance, you are engaging somebody in uh, uh, you are there employing somebody and you think the person will perform at the top of his ability or her ability? No. For instance, if you, if you engage an eight years general accountant, you will, you make him a note counter in the bank, and you think he will give you excellent result, excellent performance, 
he can, the person will not. He's not motivated. She's not motivated to do it. These are the things we should have to do, put into consideration. It's a deliberate action. The fact that we are in the same country doesn't mean that the issue of diversity is not important. The issue of inclusion is not important. Within this same profession, like I've said, we have seen discrimination based on previous background, previous certification before becoming other accountant. Whereas the ACA should be a leveler for everybody, but today it is not. So my appeal to managers, would be manager is to put this in mind that look, people should not be denied opportunity to contribute meaningfully to the organization because they have a background that is unconsciously biased against. It is a collective action. And the beauty of it is that if we do it, we achieve more synergy. We all, we all, we all understand the concept of synergy as accountants. Why can I, why should I, with background in eight years, join a, 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 an audit firm and I cannot become a managing partner when I've fully and totally contributed to the organization? Let us think about this. This is a challenge to us. Even your own little process as a manager, when you are recruiting, all this by us. Oh, do you want to recruit somebody from your school, from your local government, from your mosque, from your church alone? Or will you give equal opportunity to everybody? Let everybody come and prove himself or herself. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, sir, for that insightful lecture on diversity and inclusion, promoting diversity within the accounting profession and fostering inclusive workplace. I'm sure participants will agree with me that you've done a very good job this morning. We're not going to let you go yet. I think we still have questions. We'll have a few questions, but because of time, we might not take every one of them. So I'll just quickly run through the ones that we have. Okay, Stephen said, in my interaction with people, cultural background influences job offer here in Nigeria. How then can this orient the professional body of ICANN? What's your opinion about that? Yeah, like I said, I think uh, I would challenge the institute to include it part of their curriculum to begin to teach diversity in the workplace. Diversity and inclusion in the workplace should be one of the um part of the curriculum. It's also it could also be taught at the orientation level when we are doing um uh, what do you call it? When you are doing um when you are being admitted into membership. Induction. Oh, uh, induction. At induction induction. Stage, it should be one of the lectures. Let me one of the lectures that should be given. People should they should talk to new academy about diversity and inclusion. But for those who are already uh in organization that are already in existence, so that should also be included as part of MCP program. Because with this in this era of globalization, we need this that we need this more than ever before. And the truth is that there are a lot of professionals that are rotting away in Nigeria today because of this discrimination. It is there, it is sad. Those who know it, know it. Those who know it, feel it. Okay. People still but you know, that's that's also why we are having these sessions. Um, yeah. Just to make sure that the young people are not falling short of the same thing. That the knowledge of something helps you to stay away from that thing. So that's why, that's what the Institute of Chartered Accountants is doing to bring in this um, unpopular subjects, unconscious things, things that we do without knowing that we're doing them. That's the essence of why we're here today. So, so just well, keep coming on board, much. learning and training. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bulutife. Okay, sir. Yeah, somebody is saying, the say, what should be the focus of recruitment? Should we place inclusion above meritocracy or should merit come first? and inclusivity next. What's your opinion, sir? There's, there's always been that argument, even across board, even here, that that's a argument there. But yes, meritocracy is very important. We cannot um, we cannot take away meritocracy. But the question is like, how do you know somebody is not good if you continually deny the best opportunity to prove himself or herself? 
So if you are a general accountant, I me mean, for instance, to be a general accountant is not just some it's not something you pick on this on the road or on the street. There is there is a baseline knowledge you must possess to become a general accountant. So if you are a general accountant, you cannot say that the general accountant lack, lack um merit to perform in an organization. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to buy that. I wouldn't believe that a general accountant has nothing else to offer any organization. Uh, yes, I agree that we do not have equal level of competence. Fine. But then a general accountant should be given room to prove himself or herself. So we are not going to, you can't compromise mer merit, but sometimes also there are times that you have to create a balance, you know, whereby, you know, if you say merit is based because you somebody asked for his class in in the university, that doesn't make it's it's, it's more eligible than somebody that taught class. Somebody could have a taught class because of maybe a family issue, somebody losing his or a breadwinner three weeks to the exam. We may not perform very well in the exam, but that does not determine his or her knowledge. This person may be more cerebral than somebody who is able to, I mean. Without social life, everything just you know uh, got first class in, in school. So certification, certificate grading is not the test of the, the accurate test of knowledge. I will humbly submit. Okay. So we have yeah. to test them. We have to give them an opportunity before we can say, hey, they don't, they, they cannot perform. Of course, I, I'm 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 advocate of if you can hire them, oh. you can fire them. If they don't perform, let them go. But don't deny the opportunity to come in. Mm. Yeah, there's. Um, I just want to also add to this question. Yeah, it may appear that there is a. Um, I think there is a thin line, maybe, and some kind of um ambiguity, um, some kind of complexity between determining what is micro, uh, meritocracy and separating it from um exclusive the exclusivity of being discriminative. It doesn't, um, when you want to assess people, merit meritocracy, yes, will always stand. But this principle is saying to us, don't discriminate people unduly for um, reasons that are not really merit reasons. So every chartered accountant is a chartered accountant. And if it's a job, like you all graduate from school and you need a chartered accountant amongst those who have just graduated from school with one or two years experience, then the discrimination should not be, from what we have heard now, should not be because this person went to the same school I went to or because this person is from my village or this person is from my country and all that. We should, people should be given equal opportunities. And what it means is that organizations should be able to have standard ways of assessing people that is purely on merit. It has nothing to do with um, special um, affinities to one another, but you, you assess people the way they are and give them the positions that they deserve to have purely by their qualifications and they, that they have merited those, um, those positions based on unbiased principles of assessment. So uh, that's just my own contribution to um, this uh, meritocracy versus um, exclusive, um, inclusion and diversity. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, thank you thank for that insightful uh, addition. Uh, that is true. Again, sometimes merit, meritocracy, merit is also difficult to measure. Because if I don't, if, if you don't give me opportunity, how, how can you tell me that I lack performance? I don't have ability to perform. It is when you give me opportunity that you can assess me. The salary that I bring to you is just I went through, I went to school. Not that it doesn't actually speak of my capability to do the job or not able to do the job. Mm. Wow. Okay. I think we need more time. Maybe one maybe one of our sessions in um, this young accountants development mm. committee will just speak to the subject of um diversity and inclusivity because I don't think this few moments that we have yeah. is enough to share, to really engage and collaborate on that subject. I think there's a lot to it and um, 
but um, we're, we're gaining insights all the time. Yeah. The little knowledge is better than no knowledge, knowing that okay. this thing like this is there. And so we are conscious and deliberate about the steps we take every day. Yes, ma. I, 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 I totally agree with you, ma. I totally agree with you on it. Okay, I think for most of the questions, they're all interrelated. Most of the questions I'm reading on the on the Q and A, most of them are all interrelated. And um, the speaker as well as our chairman have done justice to these questions. So hopefully, when we in our next webinar, we might now go deeper into it. So we'll get more explanations about it. Yes, can we hear from our chairman? In the, on insights about this, and then we'll call on the board member to help with the vote of things. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bolutife Oluwadele. You have done justice. You have given us insights again. Uh, learning is, we have learned a lot from you. Um, we have a lot of chartered accountants here who are young people. And it's good to learn from senior people like you who are mentors to us, um, what happens in the workplace and um, and broadening our understanding of the pitfalls that we should avoid when it comes to discriminating people. So um, we'll learn, um, We'll go back to your slides and we'll take more um, and for us to focus more and um, imbibe these things into us. Um, we're really, really grateful and we know that we will have more sessions with you. Probably you'll give us some more, maybe a full day someday to help us <laughs> learn more on this. So um, thank you. Everyone here is really happy to um, have this mind-blowing time with you. And I'm going to call on one of my committee board members here, who is all, he's a young person, so that you can hear from the young people. I'm saying thank you as the chairman of the, of the um, committee, but the younger people are here and they will express themselves in better terms. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And to join from the voice, to join the voice of our chairman is one of our board members, Mr. Allen. So please come in here from you as you help with the vote of thanks to our facilitators. And young accountants board. listening, if you are happy, if you are excited, please a round of applause and um, send the reactions. Let it be obvious. Let it be yes. happy. Right, so, <laughs> it is plenty intention. of that. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's my you can see that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you okay. very much. So, so hey, Alan, yeah. All right. Good afternoon, professional colleagues, my powerful chairman and uh, facilitator, Dr. Bulu Atife Oluwa Dili FCA. Uh, my name is Suhe Allen, ACA. We appreciate your lecture and uh, it's a transforming lecture, which I myself have gathered a lot. So on behalf of the Institute, the Young Accountant Committee Development, we say thank you very much. And to our own listening audience, we also appreciate your time, your time you've committed to also give yourself to learning in this time. We appreciate you. Even the data you have used is the resources you have committed to this. God bless you very much. And we hope to see more of Dr. Bulu in our other webinars and training, and we we'll also be contacting you through your email for more guidance. Thank you very much, and thank you to the board members of the Young Accountant Committee. Wow, thank you thank very you. much for having me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The accolades are mind blowing here. Thank you so very much. To our participants, please, I want you to do something. On before we round off, we'll be having a panel discussion because we are not done. But before we go go there, please, I want you to put on the chat box what's your take home of everything we've learned since morning to stand from the three speakers. Just briefly describe your take homes on the chat box. We want to get those feedbacks. 
you know, while you do that, it's time for us to delve into a panel discussion, you know, on uh, monitoring insight for a successful career path. We're not done with us yet. We want to also let, you know, participants know how to become successful in their career path through mentoring insight. And the first person we're going to call to to open the stage for, in doing that is a member of the governing council of their institute. Is a partner with Price Waterhouse Coopers in Nigeria, that's PwC, where he leads the consumer and industrial products and services group in Nigeria, as well as West Africa. And you know what? Is also a young chartered accountant. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together as we welcome on the platform one of our council members, Mr. Oladili Oladipo, FCA. A round of applause for him as we welcome him. Yeah. And Oladili Oladipo is obviously a young accountant and he is a successful one. So we're happy to have him here. You could yes. you could you can't be learning better from any other person than him. So Dele, you're welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, all right, thank you. Good afternoon um, and good morning to Dr. Bolitifelua Dele, um, Grace and um, Dr. Femi Um, I've, I've been listening in uh, on the sessions uh, and they've been very, very enriching. Um, actually, I only registered as a participant on this webinar um, only for me to get a call um, a few hours ago from the chairman. Um, to come and be a panelist here. Yes. So um, it's a shocking one, but it's a very positively shocking one for me. Um, what I'm here to do is just to share my own perspectives um, around mentoring and particularly um, how young accountants can make a success of a mentoring um, relationship. And I'll be doing this um, largely from experience, but also from talking to people and myself being a mentor as well as being a mentee. And I think it's important that uh, we're able to bring perspectives from different roles, uh, bring those perspectives on board and, and have a conversation. Now, what I've done and um, what I've done is to just put some bullet points um, together that we can discuss and expand upon. And I'm happy that uh, we have a very rich panel here and they can also um, share their experience and their perspectives as well. Um, for me, what do, as, as mentees, as young accountants, right, what do we need to do in order to make success of um, a mentoring uh, uh, relationship, right? So if you're, if you're a mentee, uh, particularly for those of us young accountants, if you're a mentee, I think there's some few points that I'd like to share that will hopefully make it a very uh, enriching relationship for us. Number one is you need to set your goals, right? You need to be clear why you are going into a mentoring relationship and you need to be clear what your objectives are and you need to be clear what the outcome should be. Because if you do not set those goals, it's going to be difficult for a mentor to support you. And it's going to be difficult for you to determine what the outcome is, right? It will be difficult for you to determine whether or not you've made a success of that mentor relationship. Now, your goals could be personal, or they could be professional, or they could be business. But it's very, very important that in your mind, you are able to articulate and write down what these mentoring goals are. Now, because it's your own goals and really no one can make a success of those goals except you, the second thing you need to do as a mentee is to have self-drive. You need to be self-driven, you need to be purposeful, and you need to put in all your energy, your resources, and time into it. Uh, more often than not, in a mentoring relationship, especially when it's in a workplace, or you have um, a, a mentor or a coach who is guiding you from a professional perspective. If you are not driven yourself, you're not going to make a success of it. You know, a few of the things that we say in the workplace is either that um, your attitude determines your altitude or that your career is in your hands. Those are not just buzzwords for the fun of it. They mean something. Nobody can force you to be successful and nobody can force you to be a failure. All of those are still likely in your hands. Now, when you have those two attributes, um, the next step will then be for you to prepare yourself for that mentoring relationship. And what do I mean by that? Uh, you need to be deliberate. 
having set your goals, having been driven uh, as a being, you need to be deliberate that you're going into a mentor relationship. I'll share my experience with you. When I started working uh, over two decades ago, I wasn't that well exposed, right, to the need to have a mentor. Yes, I was working in a very well-established organization with processes, with a career path, with a leadership structure, etc. But I did not have anybody who unheld me. I didn't have anybody who I could say at that time I was growing under his wings or under her wings. It was simply by, you know, getting to work with a number of people within the organization and outside of the organization that I then started developing some kind of uh, um, fondness and closeness and confidence in certain people. And at a point in time, after a number of years, at a point in time, uh, I now decided that, okay, this particular gentleman is who I would like to be uh, is a role model who is accessible to me, and therefore I would like him to be my mentor. Perhaps if I had been conscious of that and gone into a mentor relationship uh, um, earlier than I did, maybe I would have even been more successful today, or maybe I have I've achieved something different from where I am today. Why am I saying that? Um, one, it's never too late to be deliberate about going into a mentor relationship. Um, as long as you are clear in your mind what the design outcome of that mentor relationship uh, will be. Now, having identified your mentor and you engage with the person, you need to be very clear and transparent and honest about why you are doing what you are doing, because within that relationship, uh, you will get some feedback, you will get some feedback, and feedback needs to be constructive. There's no, there's no such thing as a good feedback or a bad feedback. What is important is, is it constructive feedback? Is it based on a fair and honest assessment of your performance? Is it based on a clear understanding of the circumstances in which you are operating? Because the truth of the matter is, even with the best of intentions, things do not always go our way. And it's because there are other factors, other circumstances outside of our control that influence the results we are able to achieve. So even from a mentor relationship, while your mentor or your coach is trying to support you, is trying to push you, is trying to drive you, there are certain things that will cause some unintended outcomes. So your mentor will be fair and balanced in giving you that feedback because that honest feedback will also encourage you to perform uh, uh, better. And while you're getting that feedback, one of the things you also need to do as a mentee is active listening and active questioning. Now, good enough, all of us here are accountants, and I'm sure if you remember during your uh, uh, your training process in ICANN, during the examination process, there are certain subjects or certain topics that we will have uh, addressed, which require you to prove the matter until you are reasonably satisfied. Remember that, um, particularly when it comes to things like um, auditing and financial reporting. It's the same skill set that you are required to bring into a mentor relationship. You should be asking questions, you know, demonstrate that professional inquisitiveness, you know, the need to know, the urge to want to know things, demonstrate it. But while you are doing that on one hand, you also need to listen, you know, listen with an open mind, with a clear mind and with an unbiased mind. Now, we know that in reality, it's not always easy to do that, but if you put your mind to it and practice it from time to time, if you're listening to what is being said, as well as not uh, as well as well what is also not being said, you will be able to become a better person and you will be deriving the maximum value from that uh, uh, mentoring relationship. In the interest of time, I will probably just mention one thing because I know that we have a number of other well-versed uh, uh, panelists here. The last thing I would like to say, especially to young accountants and for someone who has been in practice for over two decades, do not feel entitled. Yes, you have your mentor and your coach supporting you. Uh, you have your employer whom you are probably working for and who has certain legal obligations um, regarding you. But please and please do not feel entitled. The world does not revolve around you. There are other interests, there are other stakeholders that need to be attended to. So don't feel that everything must go your way. And don't feel that if, if something does not go your way, then you trade tantrum in the workplace. We've had people, for example, uh, you know, who are in the workplace and because they claim to be Gen Z or Gen X or something, they want to decide or determine when to come to work. They want to decide or determine when they will close or what kind of clothes they will wear. You know, there's 
even within the freedom in the workplace, within the freedom in a mentoring relationship, there are still certain you know, responsibilities that you owe to the people around you. Please be mindful of those and don't take the fact that you're a young accountant or don't take the fact that, um, uh, uh, that you're a mentee. Don't take it for granted and think that everybody must do everything that you want to do. I mean, we, we can go on and on and on and have a conversation, but I'd just like to, you know, pause here and also uh, give others an opportunity to share their perspectives. Thank you. I was I was so engrossed. I didn't know my mic was still muted. I was just saying, "Wow, wow, that was that was insightful." Thank you very much, sir. Yes, I think mm -hmm. I took some things home. Set goals, self-driven, be intentional, listen. Not just about being a Gen Z participant. Do you agree with him? I'm sure we've taken one or two things home. Thank you very much, sir, my able council member. So let's also hear from our other panelists. They agree. They're already clapping. The claps, <laughs> the clap is there. They cannot afford not to clap. <laughs> it was no. short size and you really entered. Yeah, mapped. Thank yes. you, Dilly. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So can we call on our first speaker for today, if he's still here, Dr. Oladipo Olufemi Adebayo ACA, to share with us as well insights on mentoring. Um, like three minutes, please, just brief, so that yes. people can. Thank you. Exactly, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the organizer. You know, when you talk about the role of a mentor and mentee. It is very, very important. You know, I also I've had people that also mentor my, myself, like the love of our professor Tai Washaolu, Professor Salau. I learned from them. And one thing about it is that you must take instruction and learn. And according to what uh, so one of the council members, Mr. Ladilo Ladipo said, though, he said, self-driven, you must have the passion. The passion must be there. And before you know it, you are getting the arm. Encourage yourself. Thank you. Mm. Mm. That was very deep. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Can we call on uh, our second speaker? Dr. Grace Fatibi, FCA, to also share with us insights for mentoring. Okay. I think you're, you're muted, Ma. It is hanging, I think. Oh, okay, we can hear you. I think, I think it's our network. Yeah, it's not actually with it, but the network. Okay. Okay. Oh, can we hear from if she we having issues, she's having issues, technical issues. Can we quickly hear from um Dr. Polutife Oluwadele FCA? Yeah, thank you very much. The when there is no cancer, the people perish. Mm. That's the scripture. So mentoring and um it's a, it's a very critical thing because um, it provides help and assistance to the mentee. Again, it is a two-way thing. The, but like there's this adage um, in Yoruba that uh, it's a child that raises his hand that the mother will pick. Exactly. So, no, I'm the, 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 the beginning of my mentoring system is well, maybe. to recognize the need of a gap in or in his or our life that experience, you know, um, can preach and to reach out to those who have the experience, not just those who have the experience, those who are committing, you know, to sharing that experience. I may, I may have experience, but I don't have all the time to mentor everybody, for instance. So you have to reach out to somebody who is interested in you, who will have the time for you. And also, you have to make it easy for the person. Yes, it is. Um, you mean you can, 
the, the mentor can provide guidelines even in de developing your your goals, your objectives. Sometimes some mentees have a mean what you may call undefinable or immeasurable uh, objectives. So the purpose of the mentor is to guide look whatever you want to achieve it must be measurable. You remember your your um, uh, this acronym. So it must be measurable. It must you know your what is this is what is come smart. Yeah. But, so yeah. So, yeah, the, so th th those are the, th th those are the thing they sometimes because a mentee can come just like a patient going to a doctor and doctor is asking the patient that what is wrong with you and the patient says do me one kind. So if if you say it's do you one kind, what does what sickness is called do me one kind? The doctor cannot recommend any drug for you because it's doing you one kind. One kind is not a disease, not a sickness. <laughs> so you have to you have to understand the SMART acronym so that this thing okay, you be able to the 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 ability to define what you are looking for is critical to mentoring. If you cannot define what is wrong with you, where you need help, then you cannot be mentored. And a, a mentoring is not also is not a the delegated authority that take away the responsibility from you. Most of the thing is you that will still execute it. What the mentor does for you is to guide you, to let you know that this is the right, right way, this is a better way, these are the, these are other things. The commitment, because the mentor is making a sacrifice for you. Though there is joy at the end of the day, if you mentor somebody and that person succeed, and you, I mean, the person acknowledges, oh, this is my mentor, or you say, oh, that's my boy. It's just like when uh, I remember there was, um, Sorry, I'm a storyteller. There's a lady here in Canada. So the the son played for Canada. So in the I think in the last uh, World Cup or so, when this the son scored a goal, mm. this guy I mean was recorded on TV. You should see the way she was dancing. That, that's my boy. That's my boy. So there is the joy when you meet up somebody and somebody and that person succeed. But the majority of the work will be done by the mentee. The mentee must be ready to be helped. So the, the, red, the mentee must be ready to help himself or herself. So when the mentor gives you an assignment, do it. The mentee, the mentor is sacrificing for you. So and you have to appreciate that sacrifice. He doesn't have to do it. That's why I agree with um, what Mr. Ladele said, I do not feel entitled. It is a sacrifice that your mentor is making for you. Of course, success is never an offer. When you succeed, the mentor is going to share the success with you, but you are going to work more, most, on the success. So if you don't lift up your hand, the mother or the father will not lift you up. So you do the thing first, Define what you want. Define the situation you want to be addressed. Then the mentor will provide you the necessary guidance. And you have to make sure you work. You can't disagree with the mentor. What to do? I mean, by seeking clarification. If there are things that you know you cannot do, or if you are what the mentor is asking you uh, seems to be too hard for you to do, then it's either your, your goal is not well defined, or you have to make an amendment to your goal. You will define your goal, probably. But again, you are going to do most of the work. Mm. And that is, let me, let me pause there. You said, yeah, me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. What you said can never be overemphasized. You know, be very specific about what you want to be mentored about. And hopefully tomorrow you also be mentoring somebody. Let's quickly hear from uh, our second speaker, Dr. Grace Fatsubi FCA. I think she's back. Yeah, so sorry. Mm -hmm. I had um, no my problem. next yeah, it happens. Yes. It happens. <laughs> yes. So I was just trying to reiterate the fact that the mentoring process does not always have to be formal. And sometimes your mentor could even be younger than you, but must may have more experience. So it's important that we're humble 
to learn. Because sometimes you may look down on somebody just because he doesn't come in the package that you perceive the person to be a mentor. So you need to be humble and know that you can learn from just about anybody. So I think humility is something that I find very critical. If you think you can't learn, then there's every possibility that you will not learn anything from the mentor-mentee relationship. And then finally, I would want to say diligence, just like... Um, Dr. Bolitifer mentioned, you would have to do the work yourself. You would have to show up and do the work yourself. So being diligent. In fact, um, I, I've worked across different sectors, um, 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 sectors of the financial industry. Um, I applied for a job to work in um, credit guarantee. And then I ended up being put in finance. I'm a chartered accountant. I'm a fellow. I've never worked in the finance function previously. So for me, it was a huge, a rude shock. I was like, I didn't, I wasn't even interviewed for this. And here I found myself. But what helped me through that process was the fact that I was humble enough to learn from the people. And also I was diligent to put in the work. There's um. A, a, a theory which has been shown by empirical research that if you put in the work, you would become an expert. So just humble yourself, learn, and we live in a time where there's a lot of information. So just look out for information, learn as much as you can, and reach out to people who have worked that part to learn from them. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Ma. Humility, humility, humility put in the work, be diligent, and definitely you'll get there. Wow, it's been a very, very interesting so, um, time. I really that is your yeah, time, man. I just want ma? to give them a practical, I want to give a practical example. Please do, ma. We can, can't wait from, to hear from you. <laughs> from Grace. Uh, so, interestingly, every um people who know me well, or you've known me in the last one year, you know I changed, I changed um jobs from the private sector into the public sector. And it's new to me. So for me to be successful and the successes I have known in the last um, nine months, I have made even younger people my mentors because I haven't had pub um, public sector experience before now. But certainly the experiences that I have built, I have gathered from private sector has helped me, my diligence, my ability to do things by myself. And then being humble enough to learn from even the younger ones because I got there and so many people were ready to help me to give me a lending hand. Yes, many were even most of them are even younger people that were very excited to find someone like me come to join them. So I became a mentor to them. Why they became mentors to me, and we are all partnering in the journey together to be successful. So yes, your mentors could be younger people than you, um, in the job or even in age or whatever it is. You just need to take have the humility, the patience, because mentorship is also about patience. Many times you expect a lot from the other person and the person is not just meeting up. That's your expectation. But you know that there's a lot the person can give you. So you have to patiently follow through until you get you get the juice out of that mentorship relationship. So um, it's been, I just thought I should share my own experience, which I, almost everybody knows that it's a process I'm on the going now. And um, as much as you look up to me many times that maybe you can get a lot from me, but I also, I'm learning every day. I'm learning from people. I'm opening my eyes. I'm observing. There's also the power of observation. Observation. Mm -hmm. When you're diligent, when you're doing it yourself, you're observing what that person is doing. You're observing how the person speaks. You're observing how the person dresses. You're observing how the person does his things and the person's attitude and responses to things. Your mentor may not tell you everything, would not even know the things that he's doing in his life or her life, but you observe those things and you say, oh, this thing is working. I, I see uh, this. I admire this in this person. It's even from observation that you know that somebody, you want someone to become your mentor. So you observe and you follow the person's footpaths. And then when you need to ask questions, you ask questions and then the person can verbalize the teaching process. Mentorship is more of observation and then following through to the end. So um, thank you all. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Patience and observation. Some things are taught and some things are caught. 
A mentor must not teach everything. You catch some by observing. And for the patients, that's another angle to read. So, and humility. So let's cut down on our shoulder pads. Your know, shoulder pads are very high. Just cut down on it a bit. So that you can grab everything that you need to grab from the one you are looking on to as a mentor. Oh, it's been a very, very interesting moment today. I really had fun. I really had fun. I really serious. I really had fun being part of this. And I do not take this opportunity for granted. Yes, we'll be wrapping it up. It's been a long day. I cannot just say thank you enough, but I'm going to call on one of our board members again. Nkiru Okaono, Okaono ACA, to help give a vote of thanks to everybody, to our chairman, to our facilitators, to our participants, probably to me myself. Just say thank you as we listen to you. <laughs> Thank you so very um, much. Uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. So, um, yeah, just please, second. you are, you have the floor. You can speak. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, yeah. No, just a does, second. Just press me. the button. Let's hear from everyone first. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. My, my apologies for the interruption. Um, but I just want to use this opportunity to invite everyone on this um, webinar um, to also join on a weekly basis our Icon on Air program. Um, it airs on our social media platforms, our Facebook and YouTube at 6 p.m. every Thursday. Um, it's the Institute's um, showpiece um, you know, tool for engaging our members and engaging the public on very relevant topics um, from business to economics um, to technical matters. And then we also deal with uh, our wellness and soft issues as well. Even the chairman here, uh, Dr. Onjum, has been our guest, uh, you know, talking about our wellness matters. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we actually had Dr. Bolutife Ulvadili also talking about the um, ICANN Canada District um, event, which is coming up in a few months. So I'll use this opportunity once again, invite everyone, go to the Institute's um, social media platforms, like it and follow us and you will be getting the, the um, alerts. Um, if you are unable to join the live um, telecast at 6 p.m. on Thursday, Please, the recordings are available on our YouTube channel. So please uh, make sure that you take that opportunity to go and uh, look at them as well. We have a rich uh, um, list of topics that you will definitely find useful. So please, once again, I urge everyone to take advantage of that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Participants, hope you all grab that. Please take advantage of every opportunity the Institute is you know, offering to you. We've heard it from him. We have um, uh, I can on air. So do well to be part of it. If you've not joined it before, please do well to be part of it. Thank you. So let's call on Nkiru Okauma to help give a vote of thanks to all our panelists, you know, that have shared with us insights on mentoring. Nkiru thank Kaur you very much. I'm, I'm here. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, thank Chinaya. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, our chairman, for this uh, honor of giving uh, the vote of thanks to all our panelists. On the webinar, Inclusive Excellence, Building a Diverse and Engaged Accounting Community. It's been um, a whole time well spent. I want to thank our first speaker, Dr. Oladipo, for taking us on, becoming a tech savvy accountant and embracing digitalization. It was talked thoughtful and uh, very timely. We thank you so much for taking your time to dish us or serve us a very hot breakfast today. Thank you so very much, sir. Then to Dr. Grace, I really enjoyed every of your presentation. My, honestly, when you finished, I said, I wish I could thank you personally myself. Thank you so very much for making the women food very proud. Your presentation was so colorful, so enlightening, and so deep into it that we were able to grab everything you told us on sustainability reporting, the increasing importance of incorporating environmental, social, and governance factors into financial reporting. Thank you so very much, Ma. Then to our very last speaker, not really the last, last presenter, uh, Dr. Botife Oluwadele. Thank you so very much, sir, on your topic diversity and inclusion, pro promoting diversity within the accounting profession 
and fostering inclusive workplace. Thank you so very much, Star. You really gave us that impact to know that we can work beyond all those uh, diversities. We can do a whole lot more when we begin to look beyond what we call barriers and work with what will give us the best in our workplaces. Thank you so very much, Star. And on the mentoring inside, it's really been impactful. I want to thank you all, especially for letting us know that we don't just need a mentor, but we also need to grow on our own. We have to learn to be humble, put in diligence, learn practically, and put in the power of observation for us to be more. Thank you so very much. On behalf of the Young Accountants Development Committee and the Young Accountants whom have tapped into your world of knowledge, we say thank you and we we'll pray God to continue to give you more knowledge and to answer us whenever we call. Thank you. Amen. A big amen to that prayer. Yes, we round it up any amen. moment from now. Amen. Can we amen. call, uh, permit me, Ma, let's finally call on Alan Sohe to help with a general vote of thanks. You can't just stop saying thank you. It's been a very mm -hmm. beautiful day. Alan, let's hear from you. Yeah, good afternoon, professional colleagues, council member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, all facilitators, attendees. My name is Sohe Allen, the prof, uh, AC, a board member of the Young Accountant Development Committee. I want to sincerely, on behalf of the Institute, appreciate all our board members, especially the council members of the Institute for, for pulling all this together to develop the skill of the young accountant to leverage on technology to teach us how we can grow in this profession. It's not just easy. So they deserve our applause. And I want to appreciate them once again, especially our chairman, Dr. Unju, God bless you. God bless you for that. And that wonderful um, tutorial mentorship programs have been putting up. God bless you. If I one day, we'll be glad to have you as our president in the Institute. God bless you. And also, <laughs> I want to extend our greetings and our appreciations to the secretariat that have been helping us with the technical sessions. Without them, we might be having technical issues and um, this. Webinar has been going on smoothly without any itches. God bless the Secretariat of the Institute. God bless everyone and the faculty. And now to our own amiable and adorable facilitators. Life-changing seminars, worlds, in fact, discussions to be is top notch. We appreciate you. We appreciate you. And uh, we will not hesitate to always call upon you. And we young accountants of the Institute, who will be reckon, reckoning on you every time for guidance and mentorship. God bless you. They are all words that we cannot do without, especially today's webinar. God bless you all. And also to our uh, participants, God bless you. But that is what we learned in January. Always give yourself to learning. Use your resources to get things done. That is the data. We are also use our time. We need to be... I, I go through the charts. Okay. We've sat at home today listening to this lecture okay. for uh, like a celebration of our soul in this profession. God bless you. And uh, we hope to see you more in our next webinar coming up next month. And uh, we'll be glad uh, we you communicate all, to all that young accountants to always join this webinar who will also develop the skill and grow in this profession. God bless you all. And wonderful. Uh, you are all wonderful. You are too good. In fact, <laughs> Dr. Unjum, God bless you once again. We appreciate you. So, on behalf of this. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Allen. Thank you. The prof. The prof. Allen is one of the board members of this committee. Um, very active one amongst us. Um, the prof, there are some people that we have missed to say thank you to. You know, some people have actually kept our chat room very, very interesting and and wonderfully building up, making us um, really get the feedbacks that we need. You know, one of the things we talked about mentorship is that there has to be active feedback. And these people have made the mentoring process really, really feed, uh, very um, active. We want to say thank you to you. There's a, there's a name here I see that has repeatedly put in things here. His name is Mayowa. Mayowa Ajayi. We've seen you. We've seen your post, Olari Waju. 
um, Acha, Moses, you guys have made this, and many more names that I'm not mentioning right now. Olumu Iwaf, you've all um, put wonderful comments here. You've given us the feedbacks that we expect in the mentorship process. We want to say thank you. And we encourage, please, if I've not mentioned your name, not because you haven't given us the feedback, but I really, I, I, I like how they have summarized what they have learned from here. Um, it tells us that we are actually doing wonderfully well. Moriam is another person. Um, she's been able to also give us some summary to what she has learned here. Young accountants, this is the way to learn. This is the way to go. This is the way to be successful. So you are already doing it. You're already mentors in your own capacity. And we want to say thank you. See you in April because this has become a monthly exercise for us. You must learn, you must grow, you must be developed. And that is what ICANN is out to do for you. So watch out for our next series coming ending of April. This time, April, you will hear from us again. God bless you all. Thank you, Nonye. Nonye, you've been so wonderful being um, partnering with me. Facilitators, thank you, everyone. Thank you. God bless us. Thank you very much, Ma. Quickly, I think uh, we saw somebody at, on the platform, the platform, a council member, you know, that joined us in the course of the training, Rotary and Francis mm -hmm. Okuru. Is yeah. A council member. Oh. Yes, he joined yes, us. Well, been... we introduce him. Yeah, please. And can, Francis, can you put on your camera? Let them see you. Can you just say hello and appreciate? He's also, he's the deputy chairman of this um, Whoa. This space. So, Francis, are you there? Can we hear you? Rotary and Francis. Okay. Maybe okay. he's having some technical challenges. Hopefully, before yeah. we, we round up, he may say something. All okay. right. Okay. Thank you very much, Ma. It's my turn to tell you thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I do not take it for granted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an exciting time, you know, being part of this. And to our participants, you've heard it all. Everyone has said thank you. Thank you for making this possible. We will not be here if you're not here. Even though it's a free webinar, thank you for registering, staying up until now from 10 a.m. till about now. It's been a beautiful time. So I just wanted to do something before we wrap it up. In two words, in two words on the platform, describe to this training. In two words, describe to this training. And then another assignment you're going to do, please tell all your friends that are young chartered accountants that you're not joined today. Tell them about the program. Hopefully when next week, we're going to have it again. Hopefully next month, we have about... 285 participants presently now. So we want to see 2,000, you know, on our next series. So tell everyone about it, both home and abroad. So when next we meet again, it will be flooded and then we'll share insights. So it's time for us to wrap it up. So this, is, this, is the this is the closing number. So usually... Our webinars can um, can house over 500, about 500 people. And others also join on YouTube. So okay. on YouTube, we still have many more people there. Noye, you and I cannot oh, see. So let's not, okay. not understate <laughs> under what we actually have because there are many more people there on YouTube who couldn't come okay. in initially on this platform. Um, okay. But because we've, say, we've, we've spent some hours here, some people have dropped, gone for other things. Yeah. But really... Had a very wonderful turnout and um thank you so much everyone thank you very much and let's play the icon and national anthem as we call it a day the icon anthem please
from everyone of us here is bye bye. Do enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yeah. Bye. Chairman, congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Adeshola, thank you so much. Thank God you. With the glory. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank Continue. you, sir. Thank you, ma. <laughs> thank you. Had a beautiful No, you, no e launch. There's, there's e launch. Now you're not seeing it. My chairman, it congratulations for another successful <laughs> session. <laughs> we thank God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sis. Hello. How, how are you doing? My queen, my queen chair. Very well. Mrs. Babatunde Queen, Babatunde Olaito. Thank you. Yes, no. sir. <laughs> Thank you. Well thank you very much, girl. Thank you for another successful one. Yeah, yeah we thank, thank you. Thank you to everyone. Mm -hmm. awesome. awesome. Enjoy the rest thank of you your weekend. Bye. Yeah, yeah. Bye. we free, we free Bye. ourselves. Bye. Yeah, Mr. Adeshola, remaining me and you, hold that boy. <laughs> we leave you an email, Mr. Deshola. Well done, no. How are you? You you travel. You didn't even bring anything. Ah, she she's when is that she, one? She's still coming. She's still don't coming. Don't worry. I'm planning another one. So all that right. one will bring something. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Thank you, thank you. All, all right. right, thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Bolone. Are you there? My HOD. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My HOD. Apology, please. Oh, okay. Well done, well done, well done, well done. Yes, yes. <laughs> Madam Chair, my, my, okay. my HOD is with me now. Oh. Is that Mr. Mr. Razak? Razak Abolone. Oh, Mr. Razak. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't even realize you were here. No, thank no problem. Where, where thank don't you. I had a bomb. You congratulations, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for taking all my hits and all my plenty of expectations. Thank you. <laughs> 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 all right. <laughs> you are welcome. Thank, right. okay. thank you. You guys are wonderful. You're awesome. Yeah, come on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, man. Yeah, Bye. 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 B